It is Monday, January 15th at 4.05 p.m. The Board of Commissioners of the Harvard Electric Department is meeting all of the commissioners. Oh, Michael Saino is not here yet. Um, all the other commissioners are here, as is Mike Sullivan, and Beth Emery, and uh, Eric Brown. Uh, we also have on Zoom, uh, Eli Emerson, Steve Farman, and Heather, and forgive me, Heather, I don't remember your last story. So, the first item is the agenda. Uh, are there any modifications to the agenda? Um, I'd like to add a, an executive session for an employee matter. Okay. Should we put that at the end? That's fine. Okay. And I want to add my guidance to put this on the agenda, but we didn't. Well, uh, space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to so discuss we'll our policy on customer connections and projects in terms of what we charge for, how we charge, that kind of thing. Um, and I would like to put it before the budget discussion because I'm afraid that if we get into the budget discussion, we will find ourselves very late. So um, maybe maybe the logical place to put it is, um, well, we've got these other people here who don't need to be there here for that, although I would like Eli here for that discussion. So, um, Maybe maybe we put it after the discussion on the interest contribution. Um, what discussion? Uh, a discussion of what the commission rules require us to be charging customers for upfront, and what information we need to provide them, and that kind of thing. Um, if, if we have okay. a there, there needs to be a connection, and there needs to be some work done. <laughs> okay, I mean that sounds. I guess that's the portion of the conversation I was anticipating having in the context of the like the yellow barn project is that well it's not just the yellow barn it, it, it would affect potentially the yellow barn but it, it's a broader issue than just the yellow barn so yeah it's that it's fine to have it have it then uh, it's not specifically the interest component okay I'm just not sure how prepared I am to have a broader conversation um, about about that, but well, we'll find out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it relates to Rule Five Point Six Hundred. If that helps, um, and all the commissioners are not present. Okay, so the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, is there a motion? I move to approve the minutes. Uh, any discussion? No. Um, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The um, minutes are approved. Hey, all right. Mike, can you check the meeting room? And then it's done. Mm -hmm. Oh, we were just approving minutes from the no, last. Okay. No, no, no. These have already been approved. We can do that. Oh, okay. It's just the one. No. no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The next item is public comment. Um, Eric? Yeah, this is my time to talk about Yellow Bar. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had, so Minty Cullen, who's also involved in the Yellow Barn, uh, wanted to join, and she thinks she's in the waiting room, but she doesn't appear to be in the waiting room. <laughs> Um, I don't see anybody in the waiting room. I, just do I ask her to just try again? To yeah. Finish? I sent her the, you know, okay. yeah, she can't try it. Yeah. Um, He wants to talk about the interest contribution now, and then we can come back to this. Is I don't know. Sure. 
I've been trying to frame, I've been trying to think about this whole thing, you know, for months, but also in, in anticipation of this meeting. And I was hoping, I, it occurred to me that, that maybe not everybody on the board would be aware of what the OMR project is about. So I did send around an email, the flyer that CAE put together recently. I don't know if anyone got a chance to look at that, but um, basically Yellow Barn is named Yellow Barn just because there's a barn on that site, right? But the, it's, a, it's really an economic development project for, for Hardwick and for the region. And it's going to have a Cabot retail store in the barn itself. Yeah, that's a great deal. Um, and there's going to be a so that 25,000 square foot um, building next to it that now so is going up and looks, looks impressively like, huge. It's a, it's a big <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to be half Jasper Hill Farm is leasing half of that. And that's part of their overall plan to expand their cheese making, which has the effect on our local economy of them buying more milk, employing more people. They buy milk at higher um rates than uh pretty much anyone else they buy well they they uh buy well above the, the standard rate for um liquid milk uh and the other half of the accelerated building is going to be the center for agricultural economy they are um going to be running their uh mostly running their farm connects program out of there and that's a food aggregation and distribution system so they aggregate from over a hundred area farms bring it all in one place. And from there, they're able to sell the produce into farm produce into food service at colleges and that's that help that help small farmers really, you know, make a living as small farmers. Um, so anyway, there's just a it's a meant to be an economic driver and a redevelopment of an old for the town Hardwick and for the region. Um, I was also thinking about Hardwick Electric, which was originally founded probably to mostly to provide like street lighting and just for the general benefit of the people of Hardwick. And then um, shortly thereafter, as an engine for economic development and partnering with the grant industry primarily, but also other businesses. You have. And just thinking about now we're at this point where we're trying to drive some economic development with this yellow farm project on the one hand, and we're struggling with the power on the other hand. Um, and I'd like to just uh, read a couple excerpts from the um, engineering report that uh, Mike got from ELM that uh, yellow barn paid for. Um, there are a couple things in here. The truth, it, maybe you've all had a chance to read this. Um, no. So uh, it's only about five pages. It does have some technical jargon, but it also is readable, I would say. Uh, and it looks like they looked at two main areas for the current system, the thermal limits and the voltage performance. For thermal limits, um, currently, uh, you, you're running about 10% over the transformer nameplate rating under, you know, under existing contingency loading conditions. Uh, nominal equipment ratings are at risk of being exceeded on hardware organization and hardware heater. So that's just existing. And then they go on. So that is, they go on to say that historically hasn't caused problems because if you're peaking in the winter, these are thermal things, it's colder in the winter. So you're a little bit over but maybe that's not too bad. And then it says voltage performance is perhaps more limiting. Um, primary voltage is predicted to be as low as 89% of nominal values. Um, and then without the addition, the ones and the addition of the yellow bar and blue, uh, this is only marginally improved to 90% voltage at the end of the line. So you're already, like we're already operating in this scenario. Um, how, how much so of this is the scenario you're talking about is the contingency bad, the bad numbers are contingency and contingency also if the hydro is down mm -hmm. so that's another 800 kW of support on the system that we can't 
say, oh, we know that's going to be there 100 percent of the time all the time and form our contingency and lose the hydro. Sure. So that this is worst of the worst is what you know. I know, but that's exactly what we're planning for, right? Yep. I mean, I think that's what's driving this whole upgrade conversation. Yeah. So I'm just wanted to lay the stage that that's kind of the starting point, right? And um, along comes Yellow Barn trying to provide some economic uh, expansion for the area, and and probably and I don't think. I mean, we first applied for new power service in 2021. Um, we did get estimates in October of 2023 after applying for power again in January of 2023. So um, in that intervening time in the spring of 2023, Lamoille Valley Ford was also considering uh, installing EV chargers. Um, there were multiple reasons why they didn't move ahead with that. I talked with Mike about it a little bit. I talked with some of Wild Valley 40. But one of the reasons was $800,000 to Arvid Electric it seemed like a lot of money. Um, so just thinking about in the grand scheme that in the worst of the worst scenario, we're already operating in, you know, kind of marginal situation. So we have businesses in town that that could expand, that could add load. Um, we have Yellow Barn, which is in town and is adding. Uh, there are probably others out there too, right? And I think one of the things they've heard in these discussions is, well, you know, this upgrade has long been planned because we know about this current situation, but we haven't done it because the demand for power has been flat. We haven't seen any increases. I would say it's also worth considering that the demand for power has been flat because we haven't done the upgrade. Had the upgrade been done, there wouldn't be this huge cost of onboarding for the Lamoille Valley Ford to add chargers, for us to have the yellow barn, or I don't know, any other number of businesses to, to increase their usage. So after all that, so I want to flip to an email from Sean Foley, um, which Mike was kind enough to share for me. And Mike, thank you for reaching out to him and sharing this with me because Mike reaches out basically and says, how do we deal with this? These guys are asking for a lot of power. We quickly need this up. We know, we know it's in our NRP. We've we identified it as yep. to turn or not. I mean, what are we gonna All, do? What are we gonna do? And um, he writes back, Sean writes back, and he says, you know, first off, I'm going to be clear, these are my thoughts on the subject and not a department official position. Then he goes on to outline three potential uh, ways that this could work. One is it could be completely customer funded, like you could just tell the customer you got to pay. Two is um, it could be utility funded, completely utility funded extension. And three is shared costs. And, I, you know, we've gone with route three, the shared costs. But I just want to take a look at route two, the, the option two, the utility funded extension. He says, in certain cases, utilities may be responsible for funding the construction or upgrade of electric service lines, particularly if the extension benefits a broader area or serves multiple customers, like if the request just moves forward the date of a planned upgrade. Sounds a lot like what we're doing. Sean, Sean, Sean Bullard, the director, uh, he's the accounting guy, numbers guy for the Department of Public Service. He's the director of the department. He reports to the commissioner, Jim Thierry. That's why he said it's not official because he doesn't want to step on Jim's toes. It's a lot of But he's the guy that would answer the question. You know, he would give her the information to give an official. Yeah. So, I believe, I may not be correct, but I believe right now this board, which runs Harvard Electric, can decide what to do within certain guardrails, I think. Um, and I think another option that is a path I don't really want to go down because I think it would take a really long time is I think we could we, we, the Yellow Barn, or we, the Town of Hardwick, or we, somebody could petition the PUC and say, please decide this matter. 
I'm not really sure how that works, but I imagine that there's that that's also. I guess further, um, I'm thinking about timing a lot, and I've written a few emails to, to this, and um, that anybody who's driven by can see that that project is underway. Um, and uh, the project, the, the plan is to have Cabot in there and have their store running this summer, summer of 24. We'd really like them to have electricity to do that. Um, and the accelerator, but the other, the large steel building, that, the last thing is electrical switch gear. It's not coming until November of 24. But after that's there, we want to allow our tenants to get in there and really start, um, you know, occupying the space. Because there's going to be a ramp up period. I was talking with David Burke from Jasper Hill this morning. And he's like, yeah, we are, he's like, we're going to move in and we're going to start getting set up. But he's like, we know we're not going to be running the whole space. We know we're not going to have our equipment running there, you know, for, for months after that. So to me, in a perfect world, this upgrade would have already been done because it's been identified, it's kind of a resource plan, and yeah, there maybe we haven't seen an uptick in demand, but maybe that's because we didn't have the capacity. Did the Memorial, Memorial one is an interesting case study. Did the way you described it, it sounded like it was a factor or was it, it was a factor. was it the tipping factor? Because that's an interesting it was, it was described as the I mean you couldn't really say what actually would have happened six months ago. Yeah. Because they were trying to balance a lot of different or maybe it was more, it was before July flooding. But he was said it was definitely the tipping factor, and he thinks they would have done it had they not had to. Yeah. But you can't say for sure because he's like, they, they were trying to decide, and then a month or two later, Ford corporate changed the victims oh. what they had to do. Oh. So they were feeling under the gun to do it. And they basically, because it was going to be so expensive, they decided to wait and then wait and wait, and wait. And then Ford and staff, and they said, okay, yeah. excuse me. But he said they wanted to do it. They said last month, he said the 15%, no, 20%, 15 or 20% of their car sales were full pure EVs. They're looking at about 5%, you know, soon, is thinking. So they want to do it. There's a question of whether they'll do it or not. Well, I thought that all new business had to paper upgrades. Is that not a rule? Cost causers pay the cost they create, yes. And that rule is a state rule or PUC? That's PUC. So going to the PUC is there to describe, which is something you can, you can explore and say, if we wanted to, and I won't be part of this vote because I'm conflicted in my involvement with the CA family level, but could if we wanted to, is there anything that prevents us from going to PUC and saying, we view this as economic development, we view it as an acceleration, we could, you know, would you, would you support us spreading, because effectively what we're doing is we're spreading it across all our ratepayers. We're making all our ratepayers pay for this project. So the benefit of the budget. Thank you. But, and, but the benefit of it. So like the question would be the question would be uh, do they view that as a departure from the cost creator paying for the cost as bad or good and different? So how about we have Eli walk through Sean's yeah, options? That'd be good. Eli. We need that help from you. I think I don't know. <laughs> I would like to hear what he's saying. Did you did you hear Eric talking about Mr. Foley's email that we used for directions some time ago and landing where we have? 
yeah, yeah. Um, Can you walk through those items he listed and kind of give the, or go ahead, do what you're going to do. We can sort of hash it out. Right. I just want to apologize in advance since I'm stuck working from home. If I have dogs that start barking, I'm going to have to mute. We don't know anything uh, about we're all you know, <laughs> So if you, if you just see me disappear for a second, it's because my dogs are going crazy for some reason. Um, but I want to just start off and say that the points that Eric brings up are are really important issues that get brought up. I'm not going to say a lot, but on a on a on a regular basis these days, both in the context of growth um, on the electric system, so load, but also generation. Um, you'll hear generators say this a lot too, that they're they're really kind of frustrated that when they come to a utility with a project that, you know, there's some upgrade that needs to happen to the system and the generator needs to pay 100% of it. Um, even though, you know, maybe you can find some benefits that accrue to the rate payers generally or even another generator that's somewhere near the system. Like that is a conversation that is happening. Um, and I think it's it's a good one. Um, the problem is um, nothing has changed in the underlying law, We at least within Vermont, and especially with regard to municipal utilities, um, as to how you might address that. I mean, we are still dealing with you know, rate-making methodologies and practices that have been in place for 70 years. Um, and there really is not much of an exception to those rules. I'm, you know, I'm sure VEPS is having this conversation and, and you know, of, you know, Burlington Electric and others about how you might take a different approach to rates than the traditional approach. As far as I know, um, we haven't gotten there yet. We're still the PUC is still operating under the same traditional rate making methodologies it has forever. And I think what you can see in Sean's email, you know, one, two, and three are all sort of, you know, one is one is an embodiment of the exact methodology that's been in place for 70 years. And that is that, you know, if there is a individual customer that is causing a cause or a cost on the system, that customer is responsible for it 100%. Um, I think in, um, you know, we've seen because there are some ways to sort of address these costs, try to find ways that some of the benefit may be allocated to ratepayers generally. So that was essentially number three. I think a little bit of what the the allocation method we've been discussing between Mike, Steve, and I um, is really trying to look at a way to share some of the costs. And number two, which is where the utility basically does it because it's something that could you know provide economic benefits to the region, maybe not necessarily the town of Hardwick, but you know, the region that the ratepayers are a part of. That's something which has certainly been a discussion topic, but I don't think there's a sort of a methodology which we could rely on if we went into a rate case and say, this is what we were thinking here. PUC, please approve these costs um, in our rate filing. So in a situation like that, you would typically file called an accounting order or get some pre-approved treatment from the PUC to do that, to depart from the cost causer pays provision. Um, you have, I mean, I, I guess we haven't even started having a conversation about what the theory is that would get the PUC to approve all of Hardwick ratepayers paying for something that seems to benefit the town primarily. But I mean, that's something you need to think about going into that. But anyways, that's I think it's my response to the email is, you know, if we're if we're, you know, I think we've tried to find um, a way to get to three, which is you know, sort of principles which we're comfortable with um, to avoid number one. 
to try to get to number two, I think, you know, Sean is one staff member at the Department of Public Service. What we would need to do is convince three commissioners on the Public Utility Commission that there is some new methodology that should be applied here that essentially guarantees that when Hardwick Electric goes for its next rate filing, well, not its very next one, but you know, one that these costs would be included in, that the PU is going to say, you're right. You know, these are costs that legitimately your entire ratepayer should pay. Because if they don't, and if those costs don't get allowed in a rate filing, uh, we've talked about before, there's only one other source for Hardwick Electric to get funds from um, if they can't get it from their ratepayers, and that'll be the taxpayers. And that's, I think, exactly what, you know, we're, the conversation is trying to, is to find a way so the taxpayers aren't footing the bill for this. So you got to be really careful about how you'd approach that. Um, so anyways, I'll stop there at this point. Eli, is, is what you're saying that there's never been a, a case, a precedent case like this, even, you know, I've never, I'll, I'll qualify never as recent years, 10 years, 15 years, 20. There isn't a, a, a handful of cases that where this was the treatment. That I've been, a well, okay, not that I've been a part of. There are two instances that I'm aware of um, where something like this happened. One that I was involved with. So Enosburg Falls had a special rate for Franklin Foods, basically gave them a slight discount on their electric rate and were able to sort of justify that as it would preserve jobs within that community, provide, you know, some economic activity within that community. Um, and that justified what was a revenue neutral uh, sort of discount provided to Franklin Foods um, that has since expired and doesn't happen anymore. So that's one instance where the PUC was convinced sort of to approve a special rate being offered, um, which was, you know, less for this economic driver in town. And that was, um, you know, that that got PUC approval. But it did take us a bit to demonstrate that since it was revenue neutral, it wouldn't have a negative impact on the other rate payers. Um, the other one that I was not part of, but I believe back when it was IBM, it's now Global Foundries, they used to have a similar deal with GMP um, to be able to do that. Uh, essentially the same thing. They get some sort of discounted rate or maybe they're even able to buy wholesale power um, that would allow uh, IBM to sort of have a, you know, lower their energy costs a little bit and hopefully create more jobs and provide more economic activity in the Essex area. So, but generally, no, I'm not aware of instances where the PUC has said it's fine for the ratepayers to subsidize economic activity. I mean, and there's plenty of instances where they've been very hesitant to do that. I think of like even the low income rate, they've been really hesitant to have rate payers subsidize, you know, what is a sort of a discount for low income payers. They've been hesitant. Um, they've been really concerned oftentimes about uh, rate payers subsidizing taxpayer costs. Um, so we're kind of working against that here. So I'm just saying, like, it's not it's not something I'm aware of been done. And I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But if anyone from VEPSA is aware of something that I'm not, it's just there have been discussions about trying to move away from this model of cost cause or pays. But it's been pretty slow. And I'm not sure there's anything actually embedded in PUC precedent and statute that would allow us to depart from that. I mean. This, the few times we've ever tried to do anything that's inconsistent with these traditional rate making methodologies, the department especially, but also the commission have been said, well, you know, we don't, you know, we don't depart from these rules. These rules have been in place for 
you know, 70 years. So. Well, the, the, the foods place there in Enosburg is like the premier employer in Enosburg. Half the town works there. There's a big cream cheese plant. And they reduced, they gave them a, I think it was a, literally a penny and a half a kilowatt hour reduction in rates to help them through a financial crisis they were in. That's why it was temporary. Uh, but massive employer in that community. Um, and Enosburg serves Enosburg different than us. I mean, um, I would, they're, they're definitely yeah. like a unique situation there because Franklin Foods was also a huge water and sewer customer of the village. And if they lost them as a customer, there'd be a huge impact, you know, a, bad, a negative impact to the other water and sewer customers um, in the village. So, you know, they got, I'd say the PUC got around to approving it, um, but it certainly it was some work. So the my point is that the, the number of jobs proportionately with the foods and proportionate jobs at IBM. Well, I, jobs I, 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 but Eric, I don't know if you were wanted to address that, Eric. I just had a question for Eli about the upgrade generally. So it sounds like then Harvick Electric, though it has an upgrade planned in their IRP, and they have a study showing that that upgrade is necessary to the benefit of the whole um, rate payer rate base. So that upgrade could not just Harvick Electric couldn't just decide to do that upgrade. To that, that concept of acceleration. Right. Well, well, but, but, but there's a question of the, this if question it, whether it's even it, now though. I suppose oh, is what yeah. if I understood what Eric was was yeah. reading, there's there's a question of, as to whether in fact it's needed sooner or that it would be prudent to do it sooner than 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 three years from now. And that's that, you know, it uh, and that's I can't I can't speak to that. That's a I think question. <laughs> yeah, so I I can't speak to whether it's there's an argument for it to be needed now. I'm not an engineer. I would say that the, you know, the PUC and the department have been really pushing utilities to start doing five, 10 year capital planning, you know, based on what they think their load growth is going to be. And so you get that into your, your five year plan, your 10 year plan. Um, and you know you you know if things go according to what you think your load growth is going to be then you know you make that investment um and then you you're coming later to the puc to include that in rates and that's going to be you know sort of the justification for why it was reasonable for you to do that at that time i, I guess i don't know what um I, I don't know what the argument is or or for doing it earlier, but generally that's the idea. Like if it's something that you would be doing anyways, um, then the you know the ratepayers would be justified in paying for it. Um, I just don't know about like timing. I guess is part of that question. Are you doing it earlier than you would have otherwise? So I think the timeline is really important, but I do have one clarification question, um, cost causer. What if the um, if the causer is a municipal entity, like if this will, does it make a difference? Okay, great. I don't, so, I don't think that makes a difference. Okay. If, if there was no yellow bond project and we were not in contingency, we're okay in terms of our distribution. Yeah. And we're in contingency, and there's no yellow barn. We're ten percent below where we want to be. That was number seven. If we're in contingency, in contingency, no yellow barn project, bro. No high bill. Worst case, you know, you know everything. Worst case scenario, we can be deficient. Bro. And by, then, by, by how much? Five percent, ten percent. Yeah, I mean, he's gonna he's gonna give our worst case numbers in that report because he should. Right. You know, so. If there was no yellow barn, at what point of looking at that number you say, hey, we really got to do something? Yeah. You've got a future plan, but is there a typical right. point? So assume in, our, assume in our 1% growth that we essentially see mm -hmm. since I've been around here. Three years out, we'll get us 3%. 
roughly uh, that would that's how much window we have right now. About three percent. So so we have all these little growths happening over three years of little people. Right. And at some point the last guy goes over the finish line, you say to him, Oh, it's your fault, or that's right. we kind of we have to say as a utility, we've got to kind of prepare well, for this. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to. Oh, of course, I know. I mean, five KW house. Yeah. And, you know, that's right? that's exactly how it works. And that's the thing that I think people are trying to look into to say, well, that's not really fair. You know, there could have been people previous that contributed to the need for this. But the current methodology would have you tag, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back for the entire cost. This is very so, so is our charge to provide reliable electricity for us, all of our customers? In this case, wherever this area is that gets this benefit, yeah. you know, it doesn't help the people out in the farmland, but we're looking at everybody, and maybe someday yeah. we'll only do in the farmland, not the... Well, it actually does help the people in the farmland. I think it's yeah. 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 So, it, 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 it is, it, I think it's, a ben if I understand what the upgrade is about, it's a benefit to all of our customers. Yeah, in part of it. No, uh, no, it's just all, all it's system. Yeah. It's yeah. System. the whole system. So basically, what we're probing now is this question, do you think it's risk mitigation? Because that event, you'd have to have a confluence of circumstances that would push it into that contingency zone. If this happens and this happens and that happens, right? Then the basis that you design the system. Is, yeah. right on. Yes. So I guess the question is it would seem, in keeping with the times, to for boards like this to be trying to do conscientious risk mitigation. In other words, the, the sentiments now with climate change and other things are risk is real, careful. So the question is, is our is our three percent? Are we comfortable that the three percent margin and running it right till it's zero percent is the right policy? Right, and for risk are... risk mitigation policy because because we're when you say three years from now is fine to do it, not two years from now, not one. You're making a set of you you have an underlying risk tolerance yep. based on your and I don't know how you weigh that. I mean that's in effect that's what we're supposed to do with Mike's counsel. Mm -hmm. Here's here's the moment in time when the risk is too high. And I, and just to put some numbers around that, I mean for the voltage, you know, and the contingency configuration when everything is at its worst, currently, you'd only be able to provide 90% of the voltage at the end of the line. If you had yellow barn, it drops to 89%. So it's a 1% difference. And I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't have the expertise to know. I'm embarrassed to say, I've sat around here with you guys for a few years. I don't know. I don't know how to think about that. Like, is 90%? You want to be at 95%. I was going 90% is too low. Yeah, 95 is where you want to be. Yeah. And you're you already be, going to be at 90. You want to be plus or minus 5%. So then what's the probability of that contingency scenario? But the probability, I don't think matters. I think, it, I, don't we plan for contingency as our baseline? That's, that's what, I think that's what we plan for. Yeah. So, 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 so we're, already, we're already in a situation where, where we should be doing something about the voltage. And, and we assume we're going to be here based on the IRP. We're good. Right, we we we. But made, why did the RFP say three years out? Well, I'm just. I, I, no, well, it no, sounds because we were never involved. In the, uh, right, so we weren't involved, and it was a planning, and it was a planning process. How long ago? We, we were not involved. Right, I, yeah. we were not. I'm we, sorry. We, we were not. Spoke. We were not. How many years did we do the RFP? Or Steve? The RFP was filed without it ever being shown. Yes, so not. Not. Not good. Not good. Um. How, but how many years ago? Steve, Farman. Right. So it sounds like we had a planning process three years ago. But, um, and, and how Steve's often do we do IRPs, Steve? They're done on a three three year cycle. Um, and ours is due uh, this year. Next year. Well, yeah, you're yeah. due End mid, of year, mid year. Mid year twenty four. Right, so best laid plans. We 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 did we did a planning process three years ago. Now we are lucky to have an engineering study on hand with the current picture. Turns out we were actually well. What turns out is COVID hit and all these other things flatlined, 
growth and extended that three year window. Okay. I, I'll, okay all, all I'm saying is that there's a difference between the, the plan and the lived reality. And it seems like the lived reality we're, we're, we're proceeding faster than the plan anticipated. And now we are already. Oh. No, 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 no. So, no, so we're, but we're experiencing the, the system is not keeping up with the demand now. No, this it's, is just keeping up with the demand. That's yeah. not the issue. It's in the contingency configuration yeah. when everything's bad, you're not providing the right. Demand is, is, is an end concept. Yeah. I, just I shouldn't I shouldn't use that term. Yes. We we anticipated that we may need to make this upgrade in the future. We're planning for contingency. It seems like we need to make that upgrade now. That's what I'm hearing. Again, I don't know enough to know whether we should be making it or not because I'm hearing part of the thing and yeah. Um, and I don't know what the, you know, all the assumptions and everything else. What strikes me, and, and I don't know how much it would have been factored in in the last IRP in any case, and it certainly should be in this IRP, is that there's a push to electrify. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's going to bring, presumably, added load onto our system. Um, it's getting warmer. People are going to start putting in heat pumps you know, in many splits to have air conditioning in their houses and places of business. And, you know, I, I don't know what the planning is. You know, I haven't, I haven't done that kind of an analysis in 40 years. Um, and, but, but those, th but I know enough to know that those things need to be factored in. And I don't know what was factored in or where we're at. And I don't know how we deal with the situation that we're in right now, where the yellow barn needs to get going so that they can have the power when they need the power. And I guess one question that I have for you, Mike, in terms of Cabot, will we be able to get in some kind of temporary service so that they can, they'll have power? Well, it's all fed from the same system, the same transformers. So it wouldn't be temp. I mean, that would be a permanent. Oh, I, I, will the power be there for, for Cabot? That's my question. Yeah, Cabot's just a regular right. engineer. Right. Yeah. That's, 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 that's all the problem. That's coming through that same transformer. But if the trans but when is the transformer? And the transformer will be there by the summer. That is my question. Yep. Yeah. All set. Um, and then for the November, December timeline for the other building, supposing that's a slow startup. Well, we haven't even ordered any of them yet because we haven't been paid a dime. We just barely got the 425 capacity nailed down a month, two months ago. We had a lost in there, but not long ago. Mm -hmm. um, to rebuild the circuit is going to take us, you know, months and months to get the substation transformers over a year. So, the, the study that was done, Mike, was it done on the base? Was was it done on the basis then of of, of one megawatt rather than four twenty five? Yes. No, we ran all kinds of scenarios. Oh, this one just talks about one. No. So, so I guess my so. Because we were all, well, what about this? What about this? And that's when it started telling you, no, 300 is where you got to get to. Anyway, sorry. Okay, so that's, that's, um, yeah. I, I feel like this yellow barn aside, we've raised some pretty serious uh, mission questions of, of us as a commission. How, how are we taking into account the current risk on that? How are we taking into account climate change and electrification? Um, what, what I keep coming back to is that municipal growth doesn't happen in a vacuum and you can set just, everybody involved can um, invite or repel by various policy making activities. And what are we doing as the utility um, based on what what we want to see happen? And and I'm 
I mean, you, there are a lot of different answers to that, and different municipalities go in different directions. But they, yeah, uh, I don't think that's the discussion today, though. I mean, fair, no, fair enough. But I'm but I'm trying to make the point that there, there's there's an important tactical set of decisions around the yellow lines, and and we I think we've raised three separate pretty important philosophical discussions that I'm not I'm not sure what how we address those as a but but I think as a pressing matter yes we need to come to resolution. In terms of the yellow bar, because everybody needs to get on. Mm -hmm. uh, this this building is under construction. <laughs> it's going to change the face of Hardwood. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I go by it every time I come into town, um, and it's 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 going to be I different. It's electricity. <laughs> it's electricity. Um, and so that needs to be resolved. And I think, I guess, the part that the lingers with me that bothers me about this whole analysis and i hear what you're saying eli but it goes to i guess what what the puc might look at is because basically it sounds like with this with this food company in enosburg and in the other case there was some kind of a cost benefit analysis that was that was saying look when you factor in all of the things that play through this is what the effect is on the ratepayers and if it's neutral or if it's positive then you can do something, uh, but you need that kind of analysis. And that's what I haven't seen here. And I don't know, I mean, I can speculate. Um, I can speculate that, you know, it's not gonna do anything in a, in, uh, in a big way on ratepayers. I can also say, you know, we argued in terms of, of net metering that the problem with net metering was that Customers weren't contributing, you know, the, the rate that we charge per kilowatt hour brings in a whole bunch of stuff. It's it's not just the energy cost, which is our current out of pocket, but it's it's our, it's our other distribution system costs, transmission costs. Um, if we have, if we're selling more kilowatt hours, we're getting more contribution to those costs. Um, and so long as the rates priced properly, we're covering the energy component and we're getting a plus column in the column, which over, over reduces the burden that has to go on other customers. And I don't know whether there's enough from this or not, or when the costs are going to be hitting. Um, but if, if there's that kind of analysis, I mean, that, that, that could affect things, but. That'd be great. But that's not an analysis that we can do. That's, that's an analysis that, 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 that that I can do the project we with all mean, my with all land critiques. All right. <laughs> I don't mean you. I don't mean you personally, Eric. But what I'm saying is, I, I don't. Well, I can't speak for other people sitting around around these tables. But I don't know what the loads are, how much energy is going to be used, when it's going to be used. All of those kinds of things that would be looking at how much revenue we would be getting from the yellow bar. How you know how how many kilowatt hour sales? What the kilowatt hour usage is because that's the energy component. We can then make it an assumption. It's it's something that we can provide information on in terms of the the, the electric rate impacts of it. But we need information to do that. And and so I so I'll I think I'll have, have to be. I mean, we'd have to be pretty confident with rock solid information. Well, none of this is rock solid information, Mike. Understood, I, but it's, it's rock solid. Solid basis. Yeah. Solid basis, absolutely a solid right. basis. But what? Yeah, but I mean the 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 study that this engineering company is it, it's it's all based on assumptions. Um, so you want to know how much they're going to use for what purpose? So we use them to the revenue, just to get their revenue. Yeah. Well, to get to get their to get their revenue and their and their cost causation. In uh, because these, are these going to be customers who are on on a demand charge rate or yes, yes that's what I figured. Okay, so one will be one fund. Okay, and so us, so there are three. But the way they operate can affect what our transmission costs are because mm -hmm. coincidence of load and, and all of that kind of thing. So if you have good information about that, 
we, we know what we use for planning purposes for our energy costs, what we expect our, to be paying for energy. You can back that out of, of, of the calculation. Yeah. And, and, and what you have is, is a contribution to fixed costs. You look at and and, and to, to, to what the cost is of doing this up front. But how will the PUC view that? Because that's a very valid business logic. We do that all the time in the for-profit business, make incremental decisions, incremental benefit, incremental cost. So it's a it's a great tool for profit maximization. I don't know if it's an accepted tool for utility, you know, the PUC ruling on fairness. It sounded to me that that was kind of what they were doing with the food. That's maybe be, that be like there's more. So the Eli, why don't you and Steve something. elaborate on how and why we landed where we landed? Um, well, let me, I'll just answer that question is that um, I think anytime the PUC has to depart from what it's been doing for many years, um, mm -hmm. it's going to want to have a lot of support for why that departure is in the best interest of the ratepayers as a whole. So I, I just think it really is, it's a very case specific thing. It's hard without even having done the evaluation at this point, it's really hard to say how successful you'd be, um, but they would want to see a good analysis. Um, so what we tried to do, so um, this is not a great, so Lynn, you had mentioned wanting to talk about the line extension rule. This this instance is not a perfect fit for the line extension rule, but clearly the line extension rule envisions um, what Sean identified as number one, cost cause or pays, you know, if you need to build um uh 500 foot line you know poles and wires to serve a new house then that entity besides the the service drop is like a credit um on every line extension that individual customer pays for the whole thing um and so by the way i think that's what we are doing yeah i wasn't that wasn't what i was that wasn't the point that i was raising on another point, you missed us too. Oh, well, sorry. I, I'm just responding to what um, Mike asked me to do, which was sort of get to at least the discussion, the allocation methodology we've discussed, which was to basically number three on Sean's list. Is that, is that what we're looking for? Or yes. It is? Yes, but you said you were going to answer Lynn's question first. Then you. Started. Oh, okay. Sorry, I might not have heard your. Did Did you want to restate the question, or should I just keep going with the other thing? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> um. So, because this is, I mean, this is this is different. Um. This is not just you know a new house, out on a you know, further out on a dirt road somewhere, um, you know where the previous line had ended. Uh, you know, this is a pretty decent sized development within town. Um, we sort of felt like, you know, trying to incorporate some of the other things that we've seen over at least the time I've been practicing, which is one, the concept of, you know, if there, if you can figure out, you know, how much, if you can allocate sort of capacity benefits, then that gives you a pretty good percentage, um, between you know what the customer might pay and and what the rate payers as a in general might pay, I think I've at this point I've heard maybe it was eight percent for the project and ninety two percent for the uh, rate payers as a whole. Um, so that was one way to sort of start figuring out, and, and I think that gets back to that conversation about well. You know, does this benefit the ratepayers as a whole? Was this something you might have already done? Um, so that's, you know, it's the, the idea that you're building something a little bit bigger than you thought you would need. So the- uh, not, not, Eli, just so you understand, we're not, I don't think that's part of the discussion. We're not building anything bigger than what we would have done. This is- We're just accelerating. We're just accelerating. Yep. 
Okay. Um, and, all right. Well, then the acceleration part is you just try to figure out how much sooner you're doing it than you would have normally done it. And, you know, the, the sort of methodology there would be to say if, you know, if Hardwick Electric had a million dollars sitting around and it had to spend this now on this project rather than being able to invest it, um, then what's the cost of not having the money available to them now? In reality, that's not really how it works because Hardwick doesn't have the money sitting around. It would have to borrow it. Um, but at least this is sort of the, this is the, sort of the, the concept that I've seen discussed before in situations like this. And so my proxy, like the easiest way without trying to spend a ton of time doing this is to figure out, well, you're going to borrow money for three years. You know, what would a bank charge you the interest rate? That's what they think their money is worth. So use that as a substitute for, you know, what, you know, what the cost is to Hardwick to have to spend the money now, as opposed to three years, and then apply that, you know, for the three years earlier that you're doing it, you'll figure out what the cost is to have to do it early. Um, so that's that portion of it. Can you, can you just, ex sorry, I'm looking in. Could you, can you just explain since the reality is that it would be a loan. So the difference, it's not like it's three more years of interest. It's, but, but I, I want to, I want to interject here. I think a clarifying point might be helpful is when we're talking about loans, I think we need to be very clear. Interest payments versus principal repayment, the debt repayment. Yep. And if we are using amount of capital, the interest only component is there for as long as that balance is being used. It doesn't matter if it's a hundred years, a thousand years, or one year, you're not repaying the debt. So you have to cover the interest for as long as you're using that money. You're using a construct where you're putting the you know, full amortization payment right. in with the interest. Yeah. Repaying. So the cost of the debt is the interest. Yeah. Whether it's for an hour, a day, a yep. year, or a hundred years. Yeah. And so I also, that's 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 entirely fair. I think what Eli's lined up is that's fair. If if we decided, I think that the greater leverage is on how far early are we? Yeah. Are we one year early, two years early, or three years early? The last work, body of work, which is all we have to rely on, said uh, three. So our I previous think, our said, previous you should do it. Uh, oh, wow, but that's <laughs> that's the key question. So our previous numbers were based on a twenty-year note, the first three years of interest, which Lynn identified last time. Well, that doesn't seem right, and that's what prompted us to circle back and look at this totally differently, rehashed it, and looked at principal being involved. Not that I mean, we hashed every angle and landed on hey, the cleanest thing to do here is to say. We're gonna go borrow this money today and pay it off in three years. So whatever that interest is, is the number. And that's where we- Interest made. or interest- Just the interest, just that's it. it. So we're in agreement. Yep, absolutely. And so I, I just, but I, I think it's really important here. Um, it is really important. I think we need to separate the concept of what is the dollar figure that is reasonable for the town, you know, the request, you know, the customer here to pay versus what is the best way for Hardwick to finance this? Because we, you could certainly try to answer this question about how much should the town pay um, as part of its contribution to this project, to the upgrade. But I think that that should be completely divorced from how Hardwick decides to finance this, because that is going to be a much bigger question about, you know, what we've learned recently about trying to make sure that your financing lines up with, you know, the life of the project um, and that the amortization is a good match with the depreciation and how that fits into you know, how you're going to build up your net income and your tier 
Like I, I, my strong suggestion is to figure out a way to come up with one dollar figure, whatever that is, that the town would contribute towards this upgrade, and then the town can just walk away and, and wash its hands of it and leave the electric department to figure out one how it's going to finance all of its capital upgrades over the next however many years and how that works you know how best to do that in order to enhance um its you know its ability to sort of be successful in a rate case filing so that's why i to me this methodology that i suggested allows the Hardwick Electric and the town to come up with a dollar figure that says, this is what you contribute up front after you pay it. You don't need to worry about how Hardwick Electric is going to finance this, what its principal payment is going to be, you know, will they have interest only for a while, you know, you know, what's its amortization schedule, because those questions really should be answered in the context of, you know, what is your, what is your strategy for filing rate cases in the near future? Um, so that's why I say like, when I, when I say that the, you know, the way to figure out what the cost to Hardwick Electric of having to do it three years early, may be what, you know, the local bank would give you as an interest rate on a three year note for that amount of money. That's just my very simplistic way of saying, you know, what's, what's the opportunity cost of Hardwick for not having this million dollars or whatever for three years. Um, that's typically how we might look at a situation like this um, from a utility, um, like a system upgrade customer interconnection perspective. I just want to make sure that I really think you should try to find the fair way to do this to the town and to Hardwick's ratepayers generally, and not try to blend in too much how you're actually going to finance this, because that should be more driven by what your your needs are from a rate case perspective. I don't want to put words in in, in, in in Eric's mouth or speak for and I'm not speaking for the town. I don't think the I don't think there is a particular concern about how HED ultimately finances things. Oh, you want to minimize oh, you want to minimize what you have to pay. Yeah, I'm concerned. And treat it I'm concerned as a ratepayer and I'm concerned as uh, someone elected to represent the town that our electric is well managed and that uh, our rates are good. And, I mean, I'm concerned at that level. As someone uh, involved in the yellow bar, I am absolutely unconcerned with what happens for the next. But I do want, and I guess the, the part for me that is hard to grasp is conceptually, I understand that there's a methodology where you say, look, Yellow Barn is going to use 8.5% of the capacity of this upgrade. Yellow Barn should pay for 8.5% of the cost. That I can, I can wrap my head around, even though, as I said previously, really, you know, in the best world, this upgrade would have already happened to avoid, um, you know, portable pitch at the end of the line for all customers um, in the worst scenario. But given that the upgrade hasn't happened and that, the, the, this project is kind of forcing our collective's hand. I can understand that methodology. I guess what I'm struggling with is, okay, so if the project pays for its portion of, of the upgrade, why does the project then also have to pay for interest on our electrics part? And that's what gets, that's what actually sucks the project into talking about um, how hard electric is paying for. I, I I don't understand why Hardwick Electric's cap, cap position forces us into this conversation about debt. How how is that? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, okay, so then why? I, I guess I'm confused why the project is paying for the financing. No, no, that's good. Good. So no, that no, no, no. no. No, no. There are two. There are two pieces. There are two pieces here. As I understand it, let me see yeah. the fuck. Okay. <laughs> One is that we've been operating on the basis in this discussion that 
but for the yellow book, mm -hmm. we would not be doing the upgrade until three years from now. Right. Okay. And therefore, the cost of moving this forward by three years yes. is the opportunity cost of the money that okay. we would be spending so, to do yep. over, over right. that three year period of not having yep. that money over the three year period, Thanks. which is the interest cost. Yep. Um, Makes perfect sense. sense. So, so is it? Is it wrong then to to for us to circle and it may not bear any fruit, it may not help with the situation dilemma we have, but is it wrong for us to re-examine our our IR, our last IRP, which we're gonna have to do anyway in the coming months, sort of do a refresh of that and re-examine our view of when we as a board should be telling Mike we're on board and spend the money. Because if that decision is now, not later, that alone makes a lot of this go away. Makes most of it go away. It goes into Steve Barman's new rate case, and, it, and and we're doing it on the schedule we should be doing it according to the new RFP. But the so I guess I want to just offer that up on the table as a as because that seems to me to not have any of the wild uncertainty of going to making an economic development case to the PUC. That's sort of doing our job and just doing our job the way we should do our job and updating our IRP the way we should be updating it and say, okay, now feed all the numbers in, take the amount of risk if it's normal and do it on the schedule we should do it. Now it might come back and say four years, I don't know, but it'd be convenient if it came back and said, so the right. best so of the, all the biggest driver was right now. The biggest driver in the in the last IRP was my goal of getting a second contingency. So having an express circuit built between our two substations, which includes this whole upgrade, yeah. not the yellow barn specific project max, but all this other stuff going in for the substation. Yeah. So that not only would we have contingency configuration A? Well, we would actually have a B once that circuit's back. What goes all the way to Wolf substitution? That's the real driver of the project. And our wasn't really low because our load was it was less than a percent for years. So now we're, we're we're getting a little more than a percent now. So if there's no yellow bond project and we decide that we look at our reliability want to upgrade it. The long term yeah. stability of this utility. Do we have to get approval from anyone to do that? Do we have to go to PUC to say we want to make it more reliable? No. Well, yeah, we got to ask Steve. But so we need. But eight, Steve Barman's got to tell us. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, we, and, and, and to get that into rate base, yeah. in our rate case, we'll have to justify our determination yeah. that it was that we need to do this for reliability. I mean, that takes a that that it goes through. I mean, yeah, that's it, what it said. It yeah, do it for reliability. And when I read it, and if we did that in the years from now, Joe from Brooklyn wants to put a big pizza shop in that's formed to KW. Does he have to pay here? Can that be a job? Yeah, he's got to pay for a service connection, service connection, but not part of the upgrade. This site specific costs. So, what you do is delay the yellow bond for three years. <laughs> but uh, but but going yeah, back, yeah, we'll we talk to about yeah. But we could make the decision tonight. It would be reckless and without enough information on the table. But we could we could vote. I think with tonight and say no. We want to move that project forward. We want to move the upgrade forward. forward. And, and Steve Farm and get us ready to include that in our rating. Well, but we need to. We need to. We we could. We could. We need. Information. Yeah, it'd be restless with us to do that. I what what I'm trying to think about because we've got we've got one one we've got our, our planning process, which we're coming into a situation a few months off, but not far off. But that's not going to help. Help construction. The yeah. Yellow bar. Is there some way to come up with? Some kind of payment 
that would be subject to refund, or there may be additional depending upon uh, so so that so that or time have, the payments. I mean, or, you, you know, absolutely have to have a full upfront payment because you have well that's that's bringing me to the second part of what I want to raise, which is <laughs> well. Things that we have to, okay, this was the, the, what I wanted to get on the agenda. Um, in, in seeing what the estimates look like and the information that's going out to customers, what jumped out at me in looking at it was that some of the things that we're asking a customer to pay for up front relate to things that have a lead time. Well, we have to put in an order for something and we're going to have a contractual commitment to pay for it if the customer says, Six months down the line, you know, I've changed my mind. We're left holding it, um, and and so it, it it seems to me that it is very fair to say to the customer, you have to pay for this upfront. Um, and and my reading of the rule is is that if if we don't timely get that installed, we have to pay the customer interest on what they paid us. Um, so that, that seems like a fair balancing to me. What doesn't make any sense to me is why the customer has to pay for truck time and labor time and there may have been some other stuff or things that are just generally in our inventory, um, that we're always, re you know, that we're not going out of pocket and that we're not creating any commitment on and pay for that up front. And so I'm wondering whether at least in terms, you know, I mean, I think, I think, I think there should be a general change. It, I'm, I can be convinced otherwise, but I didn't see anything in the rules. And this is why I was asking for what all the pieces of the rules were, because I didn't see anything that said we have to do it that way. So apply your thinking to this specific project, because Mike needs to order some things. Right. And so are you, you're saying, let's get a payment from the town for the things that we need to order that are, would be at our risk and have a, a, a sort of provisional process. And, 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 and if, you know, if it turns out that, that we are moving this project forward so that even what they paid towards that, then we refund. How, how much relative do I feel the numbers? What was the upgrade total cost? What's the number? 2.05 million. And how okay. much was the yellow barn that we think might be attributed to that based on any finance? 8% no. around the numbers. 8% got it right here. 170 pounds. You just put the information we have available. Right? Oh, yeah. How much I think? Probably the PS uh, study. You can barely see, but it's someone with more expertise interpret how much do we think of this demands that we be upgrading sooner how much of the call into question the, the previous three-year timeline if we're already in for contingency percentages i without seeing the stuff understanding the assumptions yep. under it yep. and 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 how one would factor in yeah. you know the current that one, so. assumptions it's a quarter of the upgrade yep Hey, Eli, is there, for the interest? Yeah. if we have always charged $5 for, for an expected cost on a $5 project, is there, is there any reason why we could only charge, do something different and only charge the $3 up front for the materials and equipment and stuff we have to order and then at the true up bill for the difference. Is there any reason why we couldn't do that? Well, I'm not sure it says it specifically in either your line extension tariff or in the rule, but the expectation is that the cost of the upgrade will be based on your estimate of the cost of the project. So what I could envision is, you know, if you need to order something a year in advance, you know, you could have them pay for that a year in advance. And then as you're mobilizing to do the project and you needed to order some materials, you could then bill them for that. 
in advance. And then as you get to construction, you're paying for labor and whatnot. You could bill for that. Um, I just, I'm not, I haven't seen where you'd say you bill them less than what your estimated cost is and then true up later the additional cost um, after the project's done. That's inconsistent with the way the rule is set up. The rule is to make sure that the utility and the ratepayers aren't stuck with uh, the costs of, um, you know, the costs of the upgrade um, if for some reason the customer requesting them doesn't or isn't able to pay after right. the project's done. So if we give a customer an estimate for $5 for a project and we go buy a dollar worth of goods and materials to do the project and six months later the co customer says, ah, forget it, we're not going to do it, then we pay them back $4. But why, why, Eli, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, no, no, I understand that that's what we do now. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. That's, 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 awesome. that's what we do now. But, but when I read the rules and even, even, and, I'm, and I, I don't know if I have a, an internet connection here where I can bring up, you know, our tariff, um, which, which, uh, by the way, is not fully on the website. That's a separate discussion. <laughs> uh, there's a reference to a tariff that's not. Oh, gotcha. Know, that's it says C tariff blah 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 attached and it's not attached. Um, again, I, I'm not suggesting that we go out of pocket, but although it's interesting that we do have a lien, um, now I don't know how that plays through with something if it's owned by the town, but ordinarily we have a tax lien. Um, if if a customer doesn't pay what they owe us, so um, they, you know we're not without remedy. Yeah, yeah. On what? I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm not saying we should go. We should go that route. I'm just noting that it's out there. Uh, but what I was su suggesting is again, and this was as a more general policy, not just for the Elmer, is that. We charge up front for the things that we have to order, specifically for the project. And we have that money in hand. So if they back out, we don't go out. I I, I think we could have a staged process where once people are, you know, if we have to hire people or we're, we're paying our people, there's an opportunity cost involved at that point because of labor and the truck time and all of that, that we that we do charge, we can charge for it. We charge for it, you know, like before, you know, it's gonna be done, not a year before it's gonna be done or six months before it's gonna be done. Um, anyway, that, um, and, and, I, and I am, and this is what I want for the notes, where in the law, where in the rules does it say that we have to do it the way? Yeah, all. Especially in this yeah. project, if we didn't do it, everything has to be paid up front. Are we breaking the rule? That's the question. Absolutely. The rule, the rule says the estimated cost of the project shall be paid before construction starts. So uh, I read into that some flexibility, Lynn, like you were saying, if there's something you need to order a year in advance, you can get that cost payment because that is prior to construction, but if it, you know, some payment you need to make to a subcontractor a week before construction starts, you know, if you collect that uh, before construction starts, you know, maybe two weeks before construction starts, that's still being consistent with the tariff. You're collecting it prior to when construction starts. I just think the concept of the rule is, you know, the the utility isn't going to be in a position where, you know, there's some anticipated cost of this project that it isn't able to collect from the customer. Um, but uh, how you maybe stage those costs, um, I think you have some flexibility there. Um, if that's what you all want to do, we got a question. I need to give me a policy. To we got, yeah. it's a $2 million project, 170000 the yellow bar. 
of an interest, the old one is 470,000, their payments. So, what is the yellow bar? It's how much? It's two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, 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 four, six, four, six, seven, 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 four, six, six, seven, three hundred twenty six. It's the total. It's the total with the interest. Base is one hundred seventy thousand. With interest, it's four sixty seven. That's like, what that like would put on the credit card. What's That's with the lower number, the lower interest. This is well, regardless. What if they said to you December twenty nine? No. There's another one. Yeah, it's it's, well, it may be less, but it's not. It's in that ball. Seventy-five thousand dollars, but okay. So it's called seven hundred four hundred thousand. Yeah, has that. What if the old bond said, "You know what? Here's one hundred seventy thousand day one. Don't charge the interest." If they, if they paid everything up front before we incurred the interest, would they have to pay the interest? But they're paying the interest on this part on the whole on the other part. Not because we're their, building the whole thing. We're not just other part. We're not just building yeah. the part for them. That's yet back to this question. Are we doing it or are we yes. accelerating it? It's making like it or not. The, the, are we the, doing it at the right time when they really The yes. question in my mind it, right. is, is there are two questions. One is the timing. But if this is a project that we would be doing anyway, that we need for the system as a whole, why are we charging 8.5% of it to the town? We're actually 25% in factory the interest. Well, no, 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 because no, this is not, it's not the same interest. No, it's not 25%. But why um, are we... I Sorry, I, I think there may have been a confusion. I'll probably I'll take credit for this confusion, possibly. Um I I when I asked the question, how much of the capacity would of this upgrade would the yellow barn or you know the customer use? I think Mike, you know, went and looked at you know how much would be flowing into the you know of the upgrade would be used by the the yellow barn um and then in my mind i said okay well so you're building it bigger than you would have anticipated without the yellow barn so they need to pay for that additional capacity and then we look at the other part that you would have built anyways and that's accelerated by three years um, I have I'm not familiar with the IRP or any transmission planning or anything like that. If what you're saying is that this exact project would have been built three years from now, same amount of capacity, Earlier. like this was anticipated exactly the way it was, then I agree. I don't think there's a reason if you're going to build this project exactly as it was in three years, then that portion of the project that doesn't doesn't make sense to do both. But I think I may have set Mike down this path of by asking that question, you know, how much of the capacity of this upgrade will the yellow barn use? And he offered up those percentages and that's what I started with. But um, what I was unfamiliar with, I think, is that the project as it's being designed right now for the yellow barn is the same project that would have been done anyways for all of HED's ratepayers three years from now. So I if if that may be my fault for the way that conversation went, but I guess I, I still haven't heard anyone definitively say you would have built this project with the same exact capacity um three years from now that you would have um without the yellow bar. Did someone say it? Right. So the, the original Right after we got the direction from Mr. Foley, we were talking about that percentage, the capacity percentage. And the one meg was 20% of the capacity of the substation to base rating of the system. And that is where that all originated. But can you can but, you just say out loud for Eli that this exact upgrade it was is what this, was envisioned? This project is the same project. So the just... upgrade, the system upgrade is the same one regardless. That's going to happen in three years, regardless of the old one. Or maybe, according to the report from PLM, should happen anyway. So we keep returning without the old one. Okay. But again, okay. yeah, I'm trying. Okay. So it seems like we've gotten rid of the eight and a half, the eight percent of the eight percent. Okay. Yes. 
So wait, I, I didn't quite hear that. Is that what he? Yes. Yeah, that's what he was saying. That, yep. That's and how much money is it? So there. So Eli, we're in agreement that the contribution towards the system upgrade should not be the yellow barn's responsibility. That should all go to all rate payers into rates. Yeah, and again, I apologize about that. I think it's just uh -huh. the way the conversation happened that we started talking about, well, what are some various methodologies to figure out how to allocate the costs? And that's why it went that way. But yeah, I mean, the idea is if you would do this project anyways, then that's totally justifiable to all the ratepayers. It's just that you're doing it earlier. So what is the cost, the opportunity cost of having to do it now versus three years from now? For Sean's email, option number two was, if you're just doing it earlier, that's a utility covered upgrade. That's not quite. You want me to read it again? Well, he said you could. You could. Yeah, could. But, then, but, 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 but the, that's the but, question to Eli. I know, but now that Eli's okay. thinking about it, yeah. he has more of the picture. Could does that, does that change yeah. anything in terms of, of the PUC's approach to this? What is it? What is that? Do? No, I don't. I don't think so. It's it's still the same question. I mean, I haven't heard. I've heard some speculation that possibly you could justify doing it now. But more importantly, don't you have a plan that is filed and approved with the PUC that says you're going to do it in three years? It, yeah, three I guess as your plan. Right, but that plan is expiring this year. And yeah, I get that, but as load growth has the load growth been drastically different? It's not just that you. It's not just a function of, of load growth. It's not just a function of historical load growth. I okay, I I hear where you're going there. So yeah. it, it, what you're saying is the analysis is still the same from the PUC standpoint. Till it's yeah. up. Because it 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 it's the customer is 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 requesting in essence is requesting the upgrade early. Yeah. So. Okay, so now the question that we're faced with, what Eric is raising, is, is it really early? Thank you. Um, and, and... Because if your current IRP said you're going to do it in a sometime frame, that IRP is expired. And as I said, and it's a lot of other factors delay it. Right. Extended it, didn't delay it. And, but with this other study that says... We don't have the comfortable for voltage, especially at the far end of the system. The voltage should be at least ninety five percent. It's ninety percent. So why wouldn't we take that data and say, Mike, why well, are to so. go forward soon? And I thought Mike also said there's a further benefit if you extend the line upgrade to world that is what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a whole other couple million bucks. <laughs> but this leads you in that direction. Oh, it, it's, it's all part building. of the it's all part of the equation. Yes. So this part will beef up our contingency because it'll be able to serve all these additional loads, including the LR. Building line beyond there to walk it sub is the express circuit component. But but this upgrade that we're talking about upgrades the substation and the lines heading towards Wolf. Yeah. So you yep. you are building in that direction, literally and figuratively. Yes, yeah. and that's that is part of that project. What what I am is it's, it's an hour and thirty five an hour and a half, and we've got other things on the agenda. But this is this is important. So, what are we talking about on the interest cost now? So, the interest cost that. Is in the most recent letter. If you should have gotten there. What's sorry. the date on that? <laughs> Would have been Thursday or Friday of last week. I read it and signed it. Oh, I don't do it. I can email it to you. Yeah, morning. that'd be good. But, but it's it was like seventy seventy five thousand dollars less, and that was based on the three year full note paid off in three years. There's the interest. And what was the interest? I think we used five point one five. Hang on, so we don't get... Hang on. 
And since then, Steve turned us on to that loan I talked about in the general manager's report for 1.7 or whatever. People's bank. People's it was 2% was what I thought. Was. Okay, 2%. Yeah. So if the yellow barn gave us the payment for $2, whatever it is, and we end up getting a much better interest rate from someone else, then we can pay them back the difference. Okay. What and I was just going to say was the. Grew up to the exact Sorry. About the, so I was just going to say the conversations we had was applying that interest rate to the. 92 percent so based on where this conversation's gone you'd apply that interest rate to the hundred percent logically that makes that makes sense but but okay so so yeah <laughs> But we're not actually getting a note. And this goes back to, to, to Eli's point about um, it, it, that, that how we fund it is separate. So the, how do we, you know, the refunding process is, is less. So why is it, why is it unfair to the rate payers for us to charge just the amount it really costs us, our, our, our real interest cost. And, and as we go through the periods of time, whatever we determine by updating our study, whether it's one year, two years, or three years, I mean, our ratepayers are protected as long as we get our actual interest covered. And there's no real need to get it over covered, you know, to collect ahead of time for something we're guessing it is. Why couldn't you collect that from the town and the project as you incur it? And so initially it might be a high rate because we're using bank funds and it's sort of in the form of a, a line of credit. And then it rolls into something that's a lower interest rate. If you're getting that amount of money from the town, that's the real cost. And anything you get above that from the town or sooner ahead of time, See, that doesn't seem fair. It seems like the rate payers are then extracting out of the town extra benefits, sooner benefits, and more benefits. So you're saying that that we arrange whatever financing we're arranging for the first bit of whatever we're doing on, on the project? And, well, for every phase, you build, this is just to throw it out there and start. I, I, you go ahead, you, the town, you should, you will be, if you want us to go forward with this project, you will have to pay the interest um, up until the point where our IRP says we need to, we would be forward. by our other indicators to move this forward. So we make flexible, whether it's three years, two years, or one year, and we can say that that'll be determined with our updated IRP. That'll determine the length of time you pay the interest. And then the amount of interest that we'll collect from you quarterly, annually, I don't know what, as we go, will be our actual rate of interest paid. So it's a line of credit where we're paying interest on a part that we're borrowing. Yeah. So it's not five percent, it's two million. And it'll be whatever interest rate we're paying. So if we initially we're probably going to be paying a higher interest rate. Then we're going to roll it into some kind of some other bond or something. And that'll be at a lower rate. And the town should pay whatever that is for whatever period we have accelerated. And the definition of acceleration is defined by the by the updated IRP. By the by the updated IRP. But it, but our, the previous discussion was that we as a board could elect, or we as a commission could elect to make upgrades as we see fit yeah. based on information that emerges. So I guess I just want to be careful yeah. as, as, as solely tying it to the IRP because I don't think we have to. It sounds like we don't have to. But but this will get dealt with in the IRP. Okay, fair yeah. enough. No, you might be right though. But if you don't need to do that. That's true. Right. What, 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 what I was thinking of more what Eli would counsel us as what we need to be showing in our process to the PUC that we're that we're that we're not being arbitrary. 
Yes. We've yes. Got real fact. We've got yep. real engineering studies. Sure. Real right. information on which. At, at least this upgrade was raised in our last IRP. There might be other emergent information that supersedes that IRP, and then and then we could make a decision based on when when the upgrade needs to happen, whether it's part of this next planning process or something. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be before then. Okay. I don't think it's realistically. I don't think it's going to be before. Then. Okay. Because what I'm hearing is we need to file this mid year. So we're we're sitting yep. in January so, now. It takes so can I just throw out like it seems to me that a possible way to look at it along these lines is you have an RP that already calls out this upgrade. It's not expired yet. Okay. You already have it. It calls out the upgrade. Further, Yellow Barn was kind enough to pay for an engineering study <laughs> that that can throw light on the fact that we're already in a state of jeopardy in the worst case scenario. And maybe that upgrade should just happen. No, but do you, do you, Mike, and, would, and Eli, would the PUC uh, consider that third party engineering study? Um, Mike Commissioner, we just paid for it. Okay. So right. that, so we could, use that. we could rely on. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. 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 So could we look at it right now or that's another special meeting? Yeah. Everybody studies it since yeah, sure. we want to vote. This is yeah, this is not mine. Like yeah. I commissioned it. He just was kind enough to share it. Yeah. And, and you're and you're comfortable with that with that study. I yes. On tooth coma one more time, but yeah, I gave them all the data to work with. So. so it's a question of following all the rules, and then also Steve Farman's got to tell us because ultimately the only place the money comes from is, is the ratepayers, either this one or some other, or everybody else. I mean, or all gets us together. But, yeah. but when the yellow barn comes online, you'll have three more ratepayers paying <laughs> quite a bit. And then if the upgrade's done, when the Loyal Valley Ford looks to do their EV chargers, they might say, well, yeah, we can do that. We don't have to like, try to shift it to more so or St. Jim. I, I just don't like I I I'm I'm certainly not in a position to say that the study that shows it may be justified from a voltage standpoint, is that it is something that the PUC is going to agree in a rate case means that it should be done now. I just don't like that seems like an engineering question and also one of how the PUC would view that in the context of when the project's actually needed. So I'm a little cautious to say that you can just agree it is absolutely needed now and that you're gonna do it now without having some more assurances from the regulators that's the case. And I just wanted to go back that the point I was making about, there was a couple of points about the way so we presented this is one, and I don't know if this was actually the suggestion, but that the town pay the interest for the first three years is I don't think either of you guys want to have to have an ongoing relationship for three years while the town pays the interest on a loan. The other component was I don't think that your optimal financing is necessarily um, sort of the best financing for answering this question. It may be that it's a different structure altogether and that you should, again, separate those two questions. What's fair for the town to pay for this project and how do you want to finance it? And then lastly, what we're really looking for is to be able to demonstrate during a rate case that whatever, if anything, that the electric department asked the town to pay to contribute for this project was fair for Hardwick's ratepayers generally. So that's really, you know, we're just looking for support to make that argument to the PUC during a rate case. 
Um, so I'll leave it there. I don't know if I see Ken, Ken popped in if he wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to note that um, the study PLM did, they did a, an internet connection study, including the yellow bar and load. I don't think it would be a very heavy list for them to just pull the yellow bar and load out and see if that changes the results of when they think the, the project would be needed. And so I, I think the, is it now or three years from now, actually could be a fairly simple question to ask if we just posed that to PLM um, and had them pull yellow barn out and, and, and rerun the analysis and tell, give you, give you an opinion. And I think that gives Eli and Steve what they need. If you've got an engineer saying, yes, even without the load it's needed today, then your your answer becomes pretty pretty straightforward and it's defensible. I I I thought that was what Eric thought the study said. Yep. It does it it he does in the study it does say what what it the current scenario is without the additional load. I wonder if Ken, are you saying that it would be better to have a study that just doesn't contemplate that additional load and just focuses on the existing? Ken, have you seen have you seen this 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 report? Not the latest one, no. But what I'm trying to get to is I think the reluctance you're hearing from Eli as far as going to the PUC is having the commission make an engineering decision to to pay for the project bring some risk with it. Where if you had your engineer with his stamp say yes, you should build that project even if the yellow barn wasn't here then you've got the justification in the rate case that you need. And that, to me, that's what it sounds like is missing is you, that particular question has not really been posed to the engineer at this point. It, it sounds like very good information. It just wasn't posed explicitly. What, what I'm gonna suggest is that we, I, mean, I think we made some 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 good progress because we we've eliminated the confusion about what theoretic what the theoretical cost is what what what's the what's the cost of buzzer what's the acceleration if there is an acceleration um so we've narrowed the question I think Ken has made a good suggestion because if that gives us what we need and the question is how quickly do we think PLM can do this and then we schedule I don't even know that we need, you know, a, a meeting to probably be good to have a meeting. Um, well, that, this that ultimately that would all land in a upcoming rate case, which isn't going to happen in two weeks. So. No, no, but again, I, I'm coming back to we have a customer or a potential customer who needs to get going on their construction. Things need to be ordered so that they'll have the power when they need the power. And the question we have, and we have a policy that says that they have to pay up front, whatever that means that they have to pay up front. Um, sure. and, and so the question is when do they? From what I've understood, they need to have paid it yesterday to be on time. So, so we're really in a critical path on time. And so the question is, what, what do they need to pay now? And can we then, if it turns out that PLM says, yes, you should be doing it now, whether or not the yellow bar is coming in. That's that's clearly the best case for the yellow bar. If, they, if that's what they say, and we charge the yellow bar something, presumably then we would refund it. Yeah. Um, and so the question is, and, and it sounds like the worst case scenario is, is in our old IRP, is that correct? Which would be the three years that we've been working from. Yes. This is three years from now. We, we're doing our double checking. We're doing our math correctly. If the old ARP was 
however many years ago and three, three years ago. And, yes, and we well, said, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve, do you have the IRP? Do you, you what year was the upgrade slated for legal therapy? Well, I was going to bring this up. I've been looking at the IRP through this conversation. Uh, I don't find any mention of the Yellow Barn project. No, no, no the Yellow no. Barn wasn't there. The Yellow Barn, we're talking about the system upgrade. The system upgrade. Yeah, this is the express circuit out of Ardwick sub. When did we anticipate that? Or maybe you know better where to find it than me, Mike. Is that going to be down in the, in the, the capital expenditure section? I don't remember. It's in there. Though. Yeah. I don't think Yellow Barn was anything up front. If we're not saying they're responsible for eighty-eight percent of the upgrade, they just accelerated the upgrade. Well, there was the interest, so what would they be paying us up front for? So site specific stuff. Yeah. Well, that's 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 yeah. I'm working on getting that to me. We're also not slow, and we're also not quick, so that's the process. But that I'm not as worried about because if that takes me a month or two to get you the money, there's still time for you to build that before the end of the year. Before the end of this year, you yeah. know, the site specific stuff. No, you think? Piece of cake. I see. Yeah. Or maybe even, even before June. Piece of cake. Yes. So that part I'm not worried about. Yeah. Okay. So that that's in the works. That, no, we don't that's in the works. That's $117,000 that we're working on paying part of electric to do the line extension and whatever you call it. So. Okay. So that's in the If it's a case of accelerating, I'm thinking about what, what, what Michael was saying that 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 the equipment's going to be ordered regardless. They're not responsible for part of the. Equipment. It's, just the it's just the interest, and before we're not going to be taking out a loan immediately, presumably. All right. Well, that's when we're going. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, multiple reasons. Yeah. Um, but what if, I like Ken's idea of going back to the yeah. alum and just saying, "What do you think?" Because I mean, me offering my interpretation is not super helpful. Yeah, I can have him run that. It's not a problem. I think this is without the yellow bond. Is it basically it does, yeah, it does. addition? The money said it'll get worse with the yellow bond. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 he's going to go back and say, "Yeah, I already did it without it." Yeah, you yeah. might. Yeah, it's there. So, or he might say, "Yeah, who knows what I'm saying?" PLN. So, so the, so have we come to the conclusion that the other equipment can be ordered? I guess the question is though, how do we figure when we just, do we just send the town? How about, how about this, um, up with this slide, that when the yellow barn pays for its site specific, that's the trigger. For the system upgrade works. We'll, we're going to move forward with our system upgrade work, work once they've committed. We're going to consider that the requirement. That's agreed. That would seem. Yeah, because, I mean, because without, without, not because without it, being, uh, it's not prudent for us to, exactly. to, to connect them on their specific stuff if we're not doing the upgrade. And then, and then the only piece is how and when, and if, if how and when yeah. we charge. So we may discover that the system upgrade is warranted prior to their connection. No, 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 no. Just, uh, yeah, prior. It doesn't matter whether it's prior to the same time. Regardless. Yeah. Regardless. Regardless of, of the there. Yeah. And at our next meeting, we reviewed the PML, the PLM study. Yeah. Um, to make the assessment about the time. Yeah, and yeah. we can, and we just need to. And we need we Steve Farmer to be. Mike needs to be feeding Steve the. the so we can shoot for next meeting, but they're pretty busy guys. So 
I'll have to okay. find out. And I don't know what they need to do, whether it's they just need to supplement it or they just need to explain it. Or, or, or it may be, yeah. if Eric's understanding of the letter is correct, maybe that, that all they have to do is just directly answer the question. In, in right. so what I want to so all those data sets, which is a lot, make sure this line segment has the right wire, has the right spacing, so the pieces in the computer model are going to do all that stuff. Right, make sure. Because if it's flawed, because if it's flawed, we can look that. Yeah. 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 So well, that was a long conversation, but it seemed to bear fruit. Okay. So so, that's okay. And the other part of that <laughs> is <laughs> the connection policy more generally. And uh, it, well, it's, it sounded to me like there's, there is a consensus, at least out of hearing from commissioners, that Assuming that it's legal to, to do so, that we shouldn't be charging, the charging up front can be phased so that we we charge for the things that need to be ordered when 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 we before we put the orders in. And the sub you know, we're, we're gonna have but Mike's point was good. Sure. Mike, Mike, what Mike was saying is give me that. As a policy, right? right? So I, Absolutely. And then he can, I, I can translate that into how we operate, and then all of us can know what we're voting for, right? Yeah. So, um, what I was going to look for is uh, a volunteer to work with me on drafting a policy. Anyone? Oh, cool. Any user comes out. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Anybody but that. And so and so hopefully that will be done and we can have that on our agenda for the next meeting. Okay. Which takes us to the next item on the agenda, which is the um great five. Oh no! Sorry, sorry, my I dropped. Uh, the power budget with Heather. <laughs> Heather, thank you for your patience. Sure. Um, oops. <clears throat> so, did you guys get the PowerPoint um, slides? Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, we'll just follow along with that. So um, I'll kind of go through <clears throat> these slides and stop me if you have um, if you have questions. Um, so the second slide is 2023 actuals compared to 2024 budget. So note that we don't actually have December actuals yet. So it's actuals from January through November, and then it's the budget for uh, December. Um, usually when we provide the budget, it's, it's comparing the previous year's budget to this current year's budget. Um, but, you know, go ahead. Yeah, we made this change. Yeah. This is sort of an 11 plus one or yeah. it's, it's a 10 yeah. plus two. Plus one. 11. Yeah. That's great. Well, that's way better. It's real. You want to share your slides? I made you a call mm -hmm. next if you want to do that. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure, I made you a co-host if you want to share your slides. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I would rather see. Sure, I can share my screen. Uh, no, they know. said they don't want you to. Go okay. They all have it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, just for, for reference, um, this is uh, hopefully helpful for you. Um, so the next page just kind of uh, is itemizing the main drivers of changes um to the to the budget uh between last year's budget and this year's budget um 
So the next slide shows a comparison of um, capacity. So uh, I'm not sure, I know that that you folks are really well informed, so I'm sure you've talked about the um, mystic um, issue uh, and that cost of service agreement that was not budgeted in 2023. Um, we have budgeted that for 2024. There are two aspects of that uh, contract. One is a fixed uh, aspect, one is a variable. So it's only the fixed that is budgeted and that's based on uh, your, basically your ISO settlement load. Um, we, we do have one new board member. So if you could speak to okay. Mystic, well, I think that would be helpful. Sure. So Mystic is a a unit that was it's a it's a large unit that um, the ISO retained for two years for reliability purposes, and uh, there um, the contract between Mystic and ISO is uh, confidential. So we only there is only a certain amount of information that we know about it. Uh, we do know what the the fixed portion uh, of that cost is. Um, so, and that's what was budgeted for 2024. Uh, but the major uh, cost component is the variable component, which um, just due to uh, market um, factors, it really all of the, the load serving entities in the last uh, last winter were just hit really, really hard um, because basically Mystic had to buy fuel ahead of time to make sure they had it on hand. And it was a mild winter. They didn't end up using the fuel. So they then had to sell it and they bought really high and ended up selling pretty low. And that was just a function of when they bought and when they sold. And so that cost difference um, basically was distributed amongst the load serving entities. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was pretty huge. I don't know off the top of my head what, um, Hardwick's portion of that, uh, was, but it's, um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's based uh, on ISO settlement load. Sorry, go ahead. Did someone I said, well, into six figures now. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So, and the fact that it wasn't budgeted also, you know, there's, there was no real way to budget for the variable portion. Um, but you know, we didn't, there was nothing budgeted at all. So now there's at least the, the, um, fixed part that's budgeted. They, uh, if you talk to anyone that analyzes the, the markets, they're going to tell you that that's much, much less likely that there's going to be, um, much of a variable component to that cost this winter, um, just be, again because of market um, because of markets, the cost of uh, uh, of fuel when they would have been purchasing was much lower, um, and uh, so it's it's uh, unlikely that we're going to see that same that same problem. <clears throat> so storage being full also affected what the potential harm would be, correct? Yeah, I mean, that all contributes to the price of gas, um, you know, what the what the storage is, and then um, different uh, global factors. Um, you know, it's a, it's a global market. So um, yeah, and, and um, storage is, is high now compared to the five-year average so um so we included the mystic uh uh program and then we also included the inventoried energy program which is new for this year um and it's it's uh, another reliability program it's january february and december so it's only the winter months um and um uh, so that increased your uh, your capacity budget. Those were both grouped in the capacity portion of your, of your budget. Um, so this slide just shows 2023, 
what your overall um, capacity budget was. It was about 230,000. Um, and then for 2024, you can see that the, the, the budget for the uh, ca capacity market portion um, is higher than um, than it was for 2023. And that's just because your uh, installed capacity requirement is higher. Um, but we also have this $57,000 that's been budgeted for for Mystic and the Inventory to Energy Program. So um, that's, you know, those two things in combination are what um, what is increasing your, your capacity budget. And that was a, a relatively big mover for you. Um, any additional questions on that? Okay, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, so we have some changes in resources. Um, so these two um, graphs are showing, they're comparing the 2019 planned purchase and the Stetson Wind project. Um, and the, the, the graph on the, or the chart on the left is showing the volume. So you can see the dark blue is the 2019 planned purchase. Um, and then the light blue is Stetson Wind. And you can see that between 2023 and 2024, the 2019 planned purchase drops in volume and Stetson increases in volume. Um, so basically the, um, when the 2019 planned purchase was was uh, finalized, you know I'm not sure what the what the reasoning was behind a drop in volume there. There obviously um, there was a purpose for it at at the time, um, but to fill that gap, um, Stetson the volume of Stetson was increased. Um, the 2019 planned purchase is a pretty low cost resource, and Stetson is a higher cost resource. Um, it's a higher cost resource just for a couple of reasons. One is that there are Vermont tier one recs associated with it. So that rec cost is, is wrapped up in the energy price. Um, and the 2019 purchase has no recs associated with it, but it was also just, again, timing of when it was, um, when the contract was entered into. Um, prices were much lower when the 2019 plan purchase was was entered into. So this um, this chart on the on the left shows volume, and then this chart on the right shows um, pricing. And I apologize, I I should have had dollar signs in here that would have made it more clear. But um, so you can see um, the effect of the change in volume and. Uh, or I, I suppose I should just say that the change in volume for for both years um, and for both um, resources in this um, uh, in this chart. And this is just charges. Um, so it's it's just the cost, you know, directly from the the counterparty. What what uh, what is the assumption in between twenty three and twenty four? for the overall volume being lower in 24 than in 23 but on your on your on the first page it's actually the total load is higher so so what what's what's the assumption of where so, so the first page the 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 actuals compared to budget is that what you're talking about yeah that's yeah actual so this is this is the 23 is actuals not not budget it's yeah, it's it's actuals from um January through November, and then it's budget for December. So um, so so, so, uh, so twenty three does twenty three on volumes equate to total load under twenty three on page. It's the page, second slide. Yeah, it's this slide. Yeah. So that's the so total load including losses um is different. That that's you know all of the load that you right, right. no that's what I that's what I said that's what I was that was my understanding and my question is we're purchasing it looks to me like we're purchasing less in 24 than we did in 23. This and is yeah that's just comparing those two resources. Sorry. 
that's just those two resources. Um, I, oh, it's only, it's only, oh, it's not every, yep. okay, okay, 2019 was all of the, okay. Yeah. Um, I think Lynn Heather was pulling out like the, the, the major driver in energy supply. Got if it. you've got that one move in those mm -hmm. two contracts, there are other things going on that are much smaller impact. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So it, it does, when I look at the um, energy compared uh, it, that's either generated internally, that's budgeted to generate internally or purchased, there is uh, a drop from 2023 to 2024. Um, and um, this is, is a big reason for that. Um, I don't know if there was if there was a reason at the time that co certain contracts were entered into that that would have um, precipitated that, but I. I would say probably the biggest driver in that is Walkit. Just because it's it's budgeted to be down for the first quarter. So the underlying assumption is Walkit's back up in April 1st. Um May. May 1st. Oh. Four. I'm sorry, not not the first quarter, yes. The first the first uh, four four months of the year. We had been planning on April, but it's going to be nice. Okay. Thank you. Which is bad for us because April's a great month of generation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It that the the <laughs> outage unfortunately covers um, a fair amount of typically good uh, good hydro months. Um, we'll get into that in the next slide. So <clears throat> this next slide shows the effect of the Walcott outage on the coverage ratio. Um, so I guess just to make sure we're all on the same page, and I know we have a new a new person, the coverage ratio is the um, the supply that you have divided by your load. So if you have a coverage ratio that's over 100%, you have more supply than you need. If you have under 100%, you have less supply than, than you need. Um, VEPSA has a policy to make sure that members are hedged between 95% and 105% um, prior to the operating month. So what we do as best we can is get contracts um, that fit as, as well as possible within the different months um, for each of our members to get as close to that, you know, 95 to 105% um, coverage ratio as possible. And then we, every month before the operating month, we will look at all of our members. We'll, you know, Hardwick, for example, we've been, um, since Walcott's been down, uh, we've been, um, you know, pulling walk it from our budgeted uh, uh, resources and saying, okay, how much do we need to buy? Do we need to actually buy anything for Hardwick? Um, and just making adjustments, um, you know, known adjustments uh, and and going out on the, on the market to buy if needed. Um, so the, uh, the dark blue is the coverage ratio for uh, Walcott being down, the light blue is the coverage ratio um, when Walcott is running. And then we've got January through April because those are the months that it's budgeted to be down. Um, so February and March are within that 95% um, to 105% coverage ratio. Um, January and April are outside of that coverage ratio. Um, and this was one of the reasons why we didn't want to do a longer term purchase for um, for Walkit because um, it's really hard to go out to the to the market for small volumes, um, and there was it's also harder. It's it's um, not as cost effective to go out and try and get different volumes um, 
every month, especially for such a small amount. Um, so basically it's, it's more cost effective to group the Walka outage with the other VEPSA members that also um, will need coverage in those months. Um, and of course we've been keeping an eye on the, on the prices um, and seeing how those are, are moving um, just to make sure that we're not um, catching you in an open uh, position when prices are, are increasing. Questions about that? So the next slide, this, um, the future energy prices swung wildly between when the 2023 budget was, um, was completed and when the 2024 budget was completed. Um, the, the future energy prices were, were astronomical. They were the highest we'd ever seen. Um, really when, when the 2023 budget was, was, um, finalized and they are still relatively high, but not, not nearly as high as they were. So, um, that affects the cost of load and it also affects your energy credits that you get for the market resources that you have. Um, so those two things tend to mostly offset. Um, so it is a huge uh, swing in terms of an input in your budget. But as you can see here, it doesn't affect your budget. It doesn't have a huge effect on your budget overall. So the, um, the two bars on the left are 2023. They're your 2023 budget. Um, and this is budget information. This is not actuals. Um, and the dark blue is energy credits for the resources, and the light blue is your load charges. So your load charges are slightly more than um, uh, than your energy credits, uh, but but not hugely so. And then the same goes for um, for the twenty twenty four budget. On the right, we've got the resource energy credits and the load charges. So the load charges again in both years are um uh slightly higher than your your energy credits but for the most part the the swings in um forward energy prices um don't uh don't have a huge effect on on your budget they don't have as much of an effect on your budget as they would if you had a really open position and this is one of the reasons why um vepsa members have that 95 to 105% um, uh, hedge policy. Heather, isn't this actually an improvement? I mean, it looks like the Delta was about 100,000, um, a little bit more than 100,000 in 2023, and it's about 75. Okay. Yeah, it's it it does change. Um, it does change things a little bit. I guess what I was just trying to showcase is that the the energy prices are are the, the difference in energy prices was huge. Um, and that does make it have an impact on your budget, but in terms of overall cost, it's, it's not huge for, for, um, overall cost difference between years, but yeah, it is, it, it is a better, um, it's better for, for Hardwick, uh, going from 2023 to 2024. So the next thing I wanted to touch base on is uh, transmission cost changes. Um, <clears throat> and there are three main categories here. There's the open access transmission tariff or OAT, which is ISO transmission. That actually uh, reduced, which is unusual. Usually the rate is usually increasing. Um, and then Velco and GMP transmission costs in increased. And that was you know, across the board for all members. Um, it's just a, a, the rate has increased. Um, so overall, um, Hardwick's transmission costs have, have increased, um, between, uh, 2023 and 2024. And what drove the big increase at Velco and GMP? Did they have some new projects or big, you know, 
just on a percentage level, that seems like a big increase. Yeah, and I apologize. I don't have an answer to that question. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know, Ken, if you have any insight into that. Yeah. I'm I'm not as familiar with GMP. Um, Velco is usually a wild card because most of Velco's costs are actually covered by ISO, ISO New England. So, so a large portion, like 85% of Velco's costs actually get rolled into that uh, OATT rate that, that Heather mentioned. And the 15 to 20% gets allocated just within Vermont utilities. And so from year to year, that number can, can move around quite a bit depending on how much Velco anticipates getting paid by ISO New England versus how much they think they're going to need to collect in state. So mm -hmm. not a huge change in projects or cost component, but it's how much do they think they're going to get from the region versus having to collect from us. We've, we've actually quite often see that Velco cost go down if they think they're going to have a good year from ISO New England. Um, is, this, is, this, is this something that's subject to a tariff or, or this is, and, and, and is this before it, FERC? Uh, is FEPSA in there, you know, contesting this, or how, what? What's what's the process on that? Yeah. So the the open access tariff is a FERC approved tariff. It's a standard tariff. The Velco component is actually under a grandfathered agreement called the 90, 1991 transmission agreement, and it's a formula rate where Velco just um, calculates its cost, overall cost of service, credits any revenue that are coming from outside sources and whatever's left gets allocated to the Vermont utilities. And the formula is extremely complex. It's a combination of your coincident peak with your, your load at the time of Vermont's peak, your individual peak load, and also brings into account how much generation you have within your territory. You get a credit if you have a local generation versus if you don't. So it's it's very, Steve actually, Steve Farman actually worked on this for many years. Um, but to, to basically answer your question, Lynn, it's, it's a formula rate that's grandfathered from 30 years ago at this point. Thanks. Okay, so uh, the next or the last thing to review is um, some changes that uh, Mike and I discussed, <laughs> excuse me, and made um, to the load forecast. So we um, worked with a company called ITRON to do a load forecast for all of EPSA members and um, the 2023 uh, load for, I believe actually 2022 and 2023 load forecasts were lower than actuals. So uh, we made some adjustments um, to, uh, we ended up not using the, the load forecast and we used the uh, actuals from 2023 actuals uh and and we made some assumptions for December um and then increased that by two percent um because the last few years the loads have been increasing by two percent um and so that's what we used for um the the budgeted load for 2024 um and um so that also will increase uh the the budget for um, uh, your your the cost of your load, um, but I think you know every month we've been budgeting or excuse me every month we've been going through the monthly um, coverage ratios. We've been getting Hardwick to ninety five percent based on the the budget values and and obviously pulling out Walcott and still every time we were we were. Um, going through CDA variances, the uh, the coverage ratio was low. So um, 
you know, it does make sense to, to make this adjustment um, because we were just finding that the forecast was not um, matching up with, with what was actually happening um, in the year. So, um, so just wanted to point that out. So this uh, value on the left is the forecasted value from ITRON and this value on the right is what was actually budgeted. Where is the 2% growth happening? Where is it happening? Correct. I don't I don't know um how the the load is how or why the load is growing. I think that um for what what geography are you talking about? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Can you repeat that? What geography or what, when you said it had been two percent load increase, where where? It's within uh Hardwick's service territory. Okay, that seems contrary to our previous conversations where we haven't been seeing. Well, this is the way you can see Well, we can right? Yeah, her number is okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. This is the difference between the, the peak load, which would be the maximum amount, and that's what drives the engineering studies. For power supply, we're more interested in what's the total kilowatt hour load across the month or year. So those were the the highlights that I wanted to touch base on. Um, does anyone have any any other questions? What's the impact of of um, Walcott being late coming online? If my team runs into a problem and. May one becomes June one or July one. You know, is it a, how big is that? What's the consequence month by month based on the way you have us planned and committed? So um I would say the if you it depends on on how long that goes because once we get into June, July, August um hydro doesn't perform very well anyway so it's already going to be out on some pretty some months that are typically um better hydro producers um but basically the effect would be you would be paying potentially paying more for um yeah i was looking for a dollar I mean, is this a is this a few tens of thousands of dollars of impact or is it much more than that? I remember when we looked at an annual impact of, of, of Walcott being out, it was below two hundred thousand dollars. But yeah, right around. but I didn't know what like May is. If we miss May or we miss June, it, it, I would it, say from the end of February, which April, May is probably half of our generation of the year. So. Oh, three months. So May will be big. We miss May. We don't want to miss May. We don't want to miss June, July, and August are negligible. So I shouldn't think of it as 200 divided by 12. I should think yeah. of it as yeah, three months. We're going to bring it. Nine, two, or three. Okay. Okay. Most yeah. of well, we lived through it this year. At 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Oh, we had, right. Yeah. At 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Oh, so that's so. actually is the. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, May is an interesting month because your your hydro is starting to come down typically, and you're still kind of early. You're not into the summer pricing, so the energy prices tend to be pretty reasonable. So I agree with Mike. I mean, you wouldn't want to miss it if if you can help it, but it's not something that's going to crush you if if you're not there. You know. I think ten to twenty thousand dollars for the month is is a reasonable estimate, right. given what we're right. seeing. Yeah, um, I'm trying to scribble out some numbers quickly. Um, I could get you more firm numbers if that's something that you would like. Um, that, could... We were just looking at dimension, and you know, is it a hundred thousand dollar risk or tens of thousands? And you help us. Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously depends on on how many months, but it I would say a few few tens of thousands, depending on how long it's out. Thanks. 
Any other questions? Heather, thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Yep, thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Next item on the agenda. Oh. <laughs> Please. <laughs> is um, discussion about filing for a 2% rate increase. So I'll just kick it off. So we, we previously, or you all previously instructed me to proceed down that road and get, get the ball rolling on the 2 percenter. But then when I identified we had to have specifically one, so here we are warning it today. And Beth and Steve and I cranked through everything pretty good uh, over the last month. And between our transmission increases and labor costs increases, including you know, health care and benefits, uh, we ended up just with those two items at 1.97%. Is that right? Figure. Um, we could throw a couple of other things in there and get it, you know, two plus, but uh, Steve's strategy, which I agree with, is we don't want to over justify because then they would say, well, why are you going to be getting two? Uh, but for right now, with our loans kind of up in the air, we don't know how much we're borrowing, we don't know the trigger of when we're going to borrow, we don't know the terms. We have a lot of plates in the air right now, with the yellow barn system upgrades, other things, trucks, whatever. Um, so we are saying let's move on this 2%. The other question that I had to follow up with Eli, which I think I mentioned before, was Mike had asked whether or not we had to wait any time frame uh, after a 2 percenter, and the answer was no, no wait time at all. So, it was, you know, this was very uh, there's no good reason to not file this two percent and get that in the coffers. Get that. And when would it be it, with the filing timing we're looking at? When will it? So we're not going to make it tomorrow, which was the goal, because we have to mail out a letter to the customers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. By the time we get the letter ready and to our vendor, our RISTA, to get it back to our billing vendor, it just can't happen tomorrow. So we're shooting for Thursday, which lands us on the rate taking effect on March 7th. Usage. Okay. Usage. Okay. So it'll still be March, it just won't be the first. The first bills will actually be, instead of March 1st, be March 15th. April 15th. Uh, because it's usage as of March 7th. Okay. So usage starts with March 7th. Listen to Beth on this. <laughs> <laughs> so the first billing, the yeah. first billing to see the rate increase in will be the one that goes out in April. April 10-4. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Thank you. Because that will include usage since. So it showed that. two different rates on the same bill? No. Usually the bills that are going out on the middle of the month, they will fall between two, three days before or after the 7th. Okay. It takes place, yep. so it's within the framework. Okay. We usually try to time it so it's on the first, so that it, it, the start of our going site is perfect, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Do we have to do anything to get it going? Before you told it, right? Uh, you already did, but you didn't do it under an agenda item, so yeah. I'd like you to do it again. Is there a motion? I move to approve a 2% rate increase for the BSC, final BSC. Any discussion? Is it the uh, What I think you should say is that, um, I think I put it in here, it was specific. Is there magic language? No, 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 no. Just the, what's the number of the simplified process, Steve? A 218D. It says it's a section 218D parentheses N parentheses filing. Great filing. I move to approve a filing of a 2% rate increase filing under 218DN. Correct. That's 
Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you for your help with this, Steve. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. I didn't do much, but you smiled a lot. <laughs> there you go. To do something. I think the big one's coming quickly. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Which takes us to the general manager's report. <laughs> yep. I had. Um, I had one question, which is, do we know what the cost, any idea of what the cost number averages will be? If it's a Monday in December, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not off the top of my head, but that's definitely a number we can bring up. I was just, I was I'm curious. Oh, she's looking. Well, she ran it. Yeah, Fina asked me because they were looking possibly. Oh, that's right. They're yeah. hoping to possibly uh, do something with it. He was running on second thousand. And it was mainly on two. There was a third one that didn't count the most you could bring through that. But that's that and that's 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 our out of pocket cost. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the lost kilowatt hour sales. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't looking for an <laughs> individual customer. Yeah, it didn't affect the KWH. didn't have affected it too much. Yeah, I would say that's going to be negligible because the main line stuff we got working on the stuff in the populous sort of populated area. It was stuff like you sell the one on and you can get her back, you know. Yeah. Are there any other questions related to no. report? Okay, which then? Oh, the. Um... A uh, quick question of the the labor increases that were in the rate case. Right. Put me in. Yeah. What? Yeah. Give me a reminder on the percentage. I believe we put in five percent, three percent. We started with three. Okay. That's based on the union contract. We don't have it. We we need to go to the So I said. It's oh, right. Yeah, this is forward. It's forward. But it's probably going to be more like five if we want to remain competitive. We're we're in a good sweet spot, right? And where you put it in the in the dock is a little low. Okay. Which takes us to the financial statements. Any questions or comments from that? Let's just the cash on hand. You guys are doing a good good job, but as soon as you start making the big payments, it's over. The new <laughs> Is your plan, Beth, to just go into the line of credit? That's the yeah, one we have. The, the one we have set up. Right. And we'll go pretty quickly with some of the big stuff. So yeah, they like the, I mentioned in my report the uh, protection and control system. They have progress payments in there, which I haven't agreed to yet. They wanted a forty percent up. I said no. Give me a better number than that. And so I said you know twenty percent, twenty five percent, be okay with that. So he worked around right that. But yeah, we're going to have some expenses here. <laughs> so I guess the key is. Just keep watching that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so every day. Yeah. <laughs> because drawing 200, I don't know if we need to do anything. I'm assuming we don't. No, no. We just draw it. No, we got it. But then, but then 
But we're if we go to... past it, which we will pretty quickly, we, that'll take a little more time. We're, we're going to need well, that's we're, we're gonna to find something else. Yeah, that's our floor to get us to yeah. actually pull on the. We bridge. also have a little bit of leverage in that we're um, anticipating doing a lot of work for the cable companies. Okay. They're prepaying up front. Good. And they're big money that yeah, we've got that's coming in. That'll help hold us over. And that's one of the reasons why this, this, is going. this has been okay so far. So um, it'll look even better in December. Great. They're going to do but that's but we but that's that's ultimately a lot. So that's that's money that we can have to be paying out. It's yes, also, yes, but right. not for not immediately. It's my belief that we'll this Vermont Vermont bond bank money that we've applied for that will be coming in. Okay. So it's kind of like just kind of like a leverage right. okay, to hold us up. So, so these the CUDs are coming in. 25 to 125 whole projects. Wow. So it isn't like we're going to go set and rebuild all these lines. And it's going to be it's all right. year. What, um, where are we catch on him? I mean, this was as of the end of November. Where as of December, we were over 500,000. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that takes us. I think another question about the financial statements. That takes us to the draft budget. So the draft budget, we just barely got both well, got my eyes on it. That was actually a little while last week. So really, we're really just looking. We just got the that's a budget to work with, and also to finalize. The, so we're really just looking at you know high level feedback before we nail something again more final for you. And I think everyone sort of has to not be trying to get something to do manual there just at the point. Next month we'll have real numbers for all of 23. Yeah. I mean, I, I was gonna so whatever you want. Yeah. I, I was gonna anyway, if we didn't have December in the numbers. Did we go with an 11 plus one? That was then, then, then you can sort of do yeah. your, because right now it takes fierce arithmetic beyond me to get. Right. I mean, if we use, so that'd be good. Or we use budget 12, we're still, we're going to be within a percent or two. It's going to be close. Yeah, this is 11 plus one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is. This, this is. is. Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't help us. 11 months, 20. Yeah. I, I've read this as just being 11 oh. months of actual. It's, I'm sorry, that's it terminology. Yeah. It's 11 months actual, one month budget. Okay, it doesn't say You're that. Sure, it doesn't look like it. It doesn't, doesn't look, look like, like it. It does not. Um, um, yeah, I don't so think it is. I, I don't think it is. Okay. Because the jump is too large. Yeah, it's a huge jump. Well, we can fix that. Anyway, that's good. This you is are correct. Yeah. It is 11 months. So, it's not the one month budget. So, whether, whatever the timing, the best of all, just have the full year. Act. Absolutely. And yeah. if, if you don't have that for some reason, just, yeah. I mean, we usually don't get it for 10 days or, yeah. you know, happy. But, 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 yeah, yeah. That, was, that, was, that, was, that was my comment as well. Um, and, and the, um, the kilowatt hour to the usage in here. Where do I find that? Is it up front? Or is it? I don't know that the kilowatt hour works for you. I think I can do it. I have a this precious power, but I think it'd be good I can put to look here. at it yeah. for the two we can do just that. to see the conversion. Absolutely. The VEPSA stuff said it was, but they, were, they said it was up 1.5%. Steve does our. A lot of the work on the yeah. sales projections. Yes. Yeah. She works as well as them. Yeah. Can, we can Steve, we have that firmed up yet. And is that where you before. is that where you think this would be is sort of up on yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then our rate increase when we had our rate increase. What's the question? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how that translates to revenue. Revenue is going to be up. The 24 yeah. revenue is, is, it'll be recognized starting in April. Yeah, they won't start paying until April. And they won't, well, okay. we'll start paying in April, so that's going to be more than that. Yeah. That's good. And then my, old, my, my only other question in here is, um, oh, I had two, sorry. One was the, if the, the, the schedule that is on page 56 about Walcott 
is a little weird because we have this strange year. And what I was wondering is, it, um, it feels like money we're spending in the market before May 1st wouldn't be accounted for the same way on operating expense. It might be capitalized. Oh, it's all capital. Right. So since we've only got, since we've, we've only got eight months of operating, shouldn't we, shouldn't the operating expense budget be sort of eight twelfths? Yeah. Yeah. And so you might want to go in there and yep. and just resize it around eight twelfths. Of Assuming that the, you are grabbing, there's certain expenses you're still having, but they, they need to go somewhere. The best place to put them is capital. Yeah, no, we, have, we really, I don't know that's like, true. Maybe, so maybe Steve Farman would tell us that's wrong. Maybe I'm going, I'm thinking like a business guy um, trying to maximize profit. We literally don't have it. So, so Steve, can we put the operating expense? Yeah, so let's just say they got in here, they relook at it for that eight twelfths, and there's a bunch of expense that they can't avoid between now and May first. Is it better for us to run that to the P and L's expense, or is it better to gather it together as part of the capital project to get the plant back in line? Well, typically, typically you wouldn't capitalize operating expenses. Well, in, in business accounting, when you're not in operation, you typically assign them to a pro to the capital project. Yeah. Now that may or may not be the right practice within a utility, but because you're not operating. I think Steve, I think time. Steve, we are going to have capital labor because we're going to be using our guys to put some of the plant back online. <laughs> That part well, well, yeah, I mean, you, okay. you've always got a, a, a judgment call there, and especially in a situation like this, the, the line between capital and expense gets blurred. Yeah. Um, do you have a capitalization policy? Um, I'm not sure if you do or not, but that would give you some guidance. Yeah. You do not. Yeah, you, you have a practice, though. I can, I can that with that. Um, Maybe if it's part of a project, it's creating. She knows what she's doing. Yeah, yeah, it's creating a new asset where it's meaningful, yeah. extending the life of an asset. That right, can... that's that gets right. capitalized, and that's what our guys would be doing out there at the yep. hydro, right. at least some of the time. Right. Okay. Well, look. The first thing is just go switch this thing to an eight to twelve to yep. twelve view. Yeah. And that'll be a help. For... It will oh. some because it's right. maybe just Trevor's time. Right. So which isn't just um. Okay. And, and then the, the last thing, I'm sorry, folks, I'm afraid I'll never get away from the list if I stop talking. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the last slide of 76 is really good and we appreciate it. It's the, the employee compensation slide. Could you add to it just a column that has the um, increase? So maybe what you need to do is on the far left and great. Just do the 2023, you know, wherever somebody is as of today. Yeah. And then or okay. and then oh. what the proposed is. Yeah. And then the percent change. And what are you what are you thinking in rough terms for the total, not by individual number? Is that is that reflecting the what percent increase is the now as far as pay? I would yeah, three, so, I three percent in July, three percent because that's off. what Steve used in his great three percent July is the base, yes. And then Mike may have decisions up and down the line where certain people, based on their tenure, their job change, whatever it is. Well, so we've, we've, always tried, we tried, we've always tried to treat all the staff the same, okay. So whatever the bargaining unit negotiates, we try to do the same thing. For for what it's worth, your rate filing has four percent in July in it. Oh. Not three. Anyway. <laughs> we were both wrong. Yeah. All okay. right. So so this this is four. When you four. When you add that column and show the increase. 
it'll be it'll what it'll be driving is for. And then you have then you use whatever you've been told to assume for your health. Yeah. All this. Gotcha. That's great. Yeah, those we pretty well have yeah, I heard about it. But the key, the key date is July one. Yes. And that's when you do all the raises. Yes. Every, everybody oh, June not June one. June one. I'll make sure June one. June one. Our bargaining agreement expires June one. So that's, that's when all the all the raises do. All except for there's not one incorporated for the end. But why don't you you should do that for for our base budget. And what, what I'd recommend with the other group is do it at this level. You know, do it at sure. do the whole four percent across the board, especially if you're doing it. And then then the, we can do our thing. But don't don't make it zero because then it sort of right. That's the whole we gotta be able to live. <laughs> Anyone have anything else to cover? Five points. Okay. Well, it's, yeah. Oh no, it's never been done. Never seen Um okay. So I'm just gonna give y'all a brief update about loans. Um Steve had given us a line or contact with People's Trust Bank out of St. Albans because they had given Enosburg some really good rates on lines of credit. So I have contacted them to see what they might be able to offer us as far as yellow bar. This has nothing to do with the FEMA reimbursement or anything like that. Um, so I'm waiting to hear back from them to give us yet another option. Um, they actually gave us for two percent revolving money credit. Right now, ours at, uh, right now ours at Union Bank is five point one five, according to Steve. Union's for about two percent for our revolving line of credit. Look at into me. Yeah, that's, that's what I was told by the people in here. Now she did she did uh tell me that they don't usually service this the heart to town harbor. It's kind of out of their service territory. So it would be an extra thing that their border committee, whoever it is, would have to vote on, but she's still gonna get me some prizes. So right. let's at least pursue it, see yeah. what we can get. Um on the Vermont Bond Bank. Uh, the amount that we put in for a loan was 1.5 million. So that that number comes from all of our damage from the uh, flood from last year. It means that I the number comes from expenses that we know we've already incurred and we paid. It includes contracts or purchase orders that we've created for no expenses, and then everything that we haven't uh, done anything yet that's kind of further out that's estimated, and that came up to 1.5 million. And Lynn, you had mentioned last month, could we get included in there is like the service restoration to our regular, not just the hydrant, that I did include that number in there, right? So our application was approved, but they have not come down to say if we're going to get the full amount or if they're going to have to prorate it based on the number of the amount of applications they get. That's what we're waiting. So the amount is it's so if it covers something we've already paid for. Yes, it so that money just becomes back in our yes. bank account is how it works. And, to, and the whole point is when we get our FEMA reimbursement, then it's going to go back to pay this loan. So they, they might come back to us and say, you, we'll give you two, 1 1.2. They could. They ask for 1.5. Right. Okay. So, so but you're feeling optimistic enough that they're not going to come back and say, I, I don't. Zero. I honestly don't. The, the key is how many people are applying. Okay. And so what were their names? So they're not. The spot is only. Okay. So it's more yeah. like the. Oh, it's it's the of the park. We're asking. It's not that we get thrown out of the park. No, exactly. Right. So, so, so we've approved 
Uh, and so it's just a case, case of corporation. It's not that they're going to go in and say, oh, this isn't as good a thing as that. They sent me a notice that said your application is approved. Yeah. Hey. And when's the, when's the deadline on this? Oh, will be at least a year. No, no, no. On the Vermont, um, Vermont on my bank, we need deadline for when are they gonna when are they gonna decide to stop taking applications and then do they the have stopped. the applications were due last week. The applications were due last week. So so that piece is done. I I I would hope I'd hear very soon. If we're yeah. going to get the, if we're going to be allowed to get the full amount, or what, and then after that the drawdown would start. And, and what have we heard if anything from the leaves? Uh, for insurance, they keep asking me updates, updates, updates. I've given them all that I have. I really don't. They haven't been meeting. I don't believe they're going to give us any kind of They have told me specifically that we've claimed about fifteen thousand that's not covered in equipment, but other than that, they have not disclaimed. Officially, and their bucket for all the towns that they've insured, including the town of Parkway, over their roads and stuff damage, is five million dollars. So yeah. that's going to get prorated too. So if we get five grand out of it, yeah, that's you know, that the passive program is not yeah. meant to. Ensure the whole state for one event. It's meant to, oh, our hardwood had a disaster. This, that's what this is for. Well, the city and towns is self insured. Right? We, well, prior to PASSIF, and I can't tell you what the acronym stands for, stands for. prior to PASSIF, none of the communities could get any insurance because it was so expensive. So they formed this PASSIF group through LEAD, and we all self funded the plan. Right. And they have money, but we all apply for that money at the same time, and then the system doesn't work. Okay. Um, yeah, I asked Mike one quick question. Sure. Uh, I should have put him in the dump, but Grace Johnstone, you can charge a project. Do you guys have any? Yeah, Brian did a site visit with the electrician and they worked up three cost estimates that she can choose from. I reviewed that letter and proved that she should have it. So it's in her court. Yep. And one of those options is reasonable cost. Reasonable what? Lower cost. Uh, none of them were cheap. I think the cheapest one is $3,500. Oh, that's good. And most expensive was maybe twelve thousand. Oh, great! So she has some options. Super. Okay. Yeah. Motion. I move that we move into executive session to discuss in the morning. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. Objection. Hearing none. Um, well, yeah. Thanks, um, Ken. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you, Ken. So, Thank you, Carmen. So we'll just have to give you the time. I don't. Um, Take it easy. All right. Am I going to end the Want to do that? No. We, we, as far as the reporting. Oh, as far as the reporting is, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's. Uh, 6.59. 6.59 and you're going into an executive session.